Good morning, everybody. My name is Claudia Casali, and I am the director of the International Museum of Ceramic in Faenza. I welcome you to this important conference, The Future of Ceramic Between Tradition and Innovation. Inside CRD, an important EU project started in 2019. This conference is addressed to uh, ceramic entrepreneurs, students, uh, designers, and those involved in ceramic production in different fields. Uh, we will listen to um, different voices of designers, artists, and scholars from the production, compare their vision and experiences. We will also talk about education and its vision for the future. Craft, art and design are also addressed through the analysis of the current economic and health crisis, because it is necessary to imagine, face and communicate a future post-pandemic vision. Through everyday objects, which come from a long and rich tradition, the focus is on research, creativity, and the figure of the designer and the maker who looks to the future and offers ideas for a new and different production. This conference is a great opportunity to reflect and expand the production space looking far ahead. So this morning we will have a rich panel of speakers, but before starting uh, I will pass the word to Victoria Dobravec, Interreg Serde EU representative, and I thank her for uh, um, the presence and uh, for the support in this very important and great project. Victoria, the word is to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Claudia, for this introduction. And thank you, most of all, for the invitation to this uh, Serde meeting. It is a pleasure uh, to be here uh, today uh, with you. And I would like to welcome you, as Claudia said, uh, from my side, uh, but also from the entire Joint Secretariat of Interreg Central Europe. As already I have been uh, presented, my name is Victoria Dobravec, and I'm a project manager at the Joint Secretariat of Interreg Central Europe. Uh, primarily, I am responsible for the projects uh, within the topic of low carbon uh, economy and energy, but also, among others, uh, I am working with CERDI uh, project. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm glad to be uh, present here uh, today, even though uh, still in this uh, virtual way, and I'm glad uh, to see that CERDI project is uh, progressing uh, well, despite all uh, these challenges we are facing at the moment. Uh, today, I'm pleased uh, to present you some uh, information about Interreg Central Europe and especially about our new program uh, for 2021-2027. Uh, as you can see uh, on this slide, before uh, I go uh, to uh, the new program for the next programming period, I would like to uh, tell you a couple of words uh, on the Interreg uh, Central uh, Europe or in general and our uh, current program. So the Interreg uh, Central Europe is one of uh, the 15 transnational cooperation programs of cohesion policy for 2040-2020 programming period, and it covers uh, nine countries in the middle of Central Europe. This area has in total around 146 million inhabitants, which includes eight capital cities and seven cities above one million inhabitants. Uh, before introducing our new program, if we can go to next slide now, um, I'm pleased also uh, to present you uh, achievements of our uh, current uh, 1420 programming period. So in our current uh, program, we had a total four calls for proposals, 
where the last one was launched in the 2019. Uh, this uh, last call was an experimental call and it aimed at capitalization of previous project results of different funding lines. And with this uh, last call, we are now funding 138 projects, which includes over 1,440 partners. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit uh, about uh, how this, uh, how uh, your SERDI uh, project fits to our uh, Central Europe com community. So the SERDI project was funded under the third priority, meaning environment and culture which responds to the need for protecting and sustainably using nat uh, natural and cultural heritage and resources. And more specifically, SERDI was funded under the specific objective 3.2, which is dealing with improvement of capacities for sustainable use of cultural and heritage resource. Under this specific objective, in total, 24 projects uh, were funded in a worth of 39 million euro. Uh, I believe this is actually on the next slide, so we can, um, uh, you, we can see this information uh, just uh, presented. And in the following slide, uh, just to, uh, in, in the next slide, just to give you uh, an impression uh, which all the projects we have funded under this uh, uh, specific objective here, you can see a third project within uh, the group of cross-sectoral cooperation and CCI entrepreneurship. And now uh, moving to the next slide and our uh, new uh, programming uh, period, we are at the moment in the final stage of process of preparing this new program for 2021-2027. And the program is based on Toro analysis and takes into account recommendations uh, from more than 1,000 partners. This program also, of course, provides a framework for uh, future calls. Uh, on this slide, uh, you can see uh, the structure of a uh, new program and how uh, our new program will most uh, likely look like. So it will have uh, four priorities. Uh, maybe most interesting uh, for our uh, listeners today is that uh, culture in our new program will not have a specific uh, and separate uh, uh, specific objective, uh, but it will be included within uh, different uh, priorities and different uh, specific objectives. So as priority one, we have uh, priority cooperating for a smarter Central Europe, which is dealing with innovation and entrepreneurship primarily. And uh, within, this prior within this priority, target groups include, of course, public and private actors of the quadruple helix innovation system, uh, such as enterprises, including also, among others, creative industries and cultural heritage institutions and their employees. If we look at the priority two, which uh, will be uh, the biggest uh, priority in our new program, this one is dealing with energy, climate change, circular economy, environment and green urban mobility. But we will also have a uh, culture in different specific objectives of this uh, priority. Uh, for example, culture is included in the specific objective uh, 2.1 uh, throughout actions such as testing uh, innovative and climate neutral solution for, for example, energy efficient renovation and heating and cooling of buildings, which include cultural heritage buildings. Furthermore, uh, we will have culture under a uh, specific objective uh, 2.2 uh, via activities uh, such as increase of climate resilience of critical infrastructure and cultural heritage sites through improved risk preparedness and risk management plan. Uh, but also culture is um, in a way represented within a specific 
specific objective uh, 2.5, uh, which is dealing with sustainable mobility, where all the activities should take into account reduction of the impacts of the transport system, among others, on cultural heritage. Then uh, we will have uh, uh, priority three. This is cooperating for a better connected Central Europe. And last but not the least, uh, priority four, uh, which is improving governance for cooperation in Central Europe. And maybe culture is even uh, the most represented within this uh, priority four, uh, because Interreg Central Europe will here support transnational actions aim at improving sectoral governance processes on all territorial levels, in particular in view on complex challenges related to digitalization, demographic change, public services of general interest, but also tourism, including culture. This, um, uh, to give you uh, some examples of activities, include integrated territorial development strategies, addressing demographic change, uh, public services, tourism and culture, but also developing and implementing integrated tourism strategies uh, beyond uh, border based on the shared Central European identity and joint historic and, and cultural heritage. And of course, uh, if you, uh, you can see on this slide, if you would uh, like to know more about uh, the program uh, for which this uh, draft has been published and the entire programming process, uh, I would uh, kindly invite you to have a look at our program website. And there you will, of course, find the most recent updates, including uh, the information of this uh, first call once uh, it will be prepared. I thank you very much uh, for your attention and I hope I managed to give you a good overview of our Interreg uh, Central Europe. And uh, to conclude, I uh, wish you a successful conference. Thank you, Victoria, for uh, your speech, uh, for your presentation, uh, to give us an overview of uh, 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 interreg programs. Uh, European projects are a great opportunity to share knowledge, experiences and best practices and to find best practices. And this uh, survey project has uh, this uh, purpose. The involvement of uh, different subjects, uh, not just museums, but also universities and uh, cultural institutions, is a great challenge and uh, opportunity for the thematic of CERDE. And uh, for introducing CERDE, uh, I will uh, show you uh, the presentation of uh, Anna Zivetsky, who is uh, uh, the director of uh, Porcelanicon in uh, Selb, uh, the museum uh, who, which is the lead partner of CERDE. Uh, and then we will uh, see her uh, greeting uh, um, for this conference. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear, ladies dear, and friends, gentlemen of dear friends of ceramics, my name, my is, name Anna is Anna Jivetsky, and I'm the director, I'm the director of Porcelanicon, Porcelanicon State, Museum, State of Museum of Porcelain. And I would like to welcome, would like you, all welcome to this you all to this new format of the mid-term mid conference. conference. As the lead partner, As the lead we have, partner, already we have put two, two years of intensive two years work, of intensive into, work the into the project with the aim of, the aim promoting, of promoting and supporting, and supporting ceramics, ceramics and ceramists and ceramists in, Central Europe. in Central Europe. This goal, this goal served by different served measures by different that complement each, each other. The creation, the creation of an interactive, of an database, interactive and database and maps for the first time, for the first time a representative, a representative overview, overview of the of the numerous ceramists, numerous ceramists in, our regions. in our regions. An important concern, An important concern our working group, our working group pass on, is to pass on well-founded well information, founded information about, styles, about styles, techniques, techniques and marketing channels, and, marketing channels and, strategies and strategies to these ceramists. To these ceramists. We have also, we have set, also ourselves set ourselves the task of providing task of training, providing training Economic topics, economic topics, and we'll be offering, we'll be offering basic, courses basic courses in this field, in, this field, in, the, future. in the near future. The promotion, the promotion of young talents young is, talents also, on the is also on the agenda. This is the presentation, is the presentation of the ceramists, ceramists and their products, and their products at, markets, at markets. 
Co-working spaces, co-working spaces are, also being, are planned, also being planned as are the possibilities, are the possibilities. E-commerce. of e-commerce. This is not this yet is a not complete, yet overview, complete of overview of service activities. Of service activities. All partners, All partners are, working are working hard to make it a success. To make it a success. When I say all, when I, say I mean all, first, I mean first and foremost, and foremost our host, our host and organizer, and today, organizer today, the Museo Internazionale de Ceramica. De la Ceramica. We are very happy. We are very happy. Guests here. Be guests here. Of course. Of we course. Would prefer we would to be prefer there in, be person, there in person. In this beautiful, in this city, beautiful of Faenza, city of Faenza and the wonderful and museum, the wonderful there. museum there. Unfortunately, Unfortunately this, is not this is not possible due to the due pandemic situation. The pandemic situation. Partners, partners represented here, represented in, the here audience, in the audience are also the are also University, the of, University West Bohemia, of West Bohemia in Pilsen, in Pilsen the National Museum, the National of, Slovenia, Museum of Slovenia in Ljubljana, in Ljubljana the Ceramics the Museum, Museum in Boleswaviec, in Boleswaviec the, technical the Technical University of Ilmenau, of Ilmenau the New Design the new University, design in, University Pölten, in St. Pölten and the Tourist and Information, the Center, Information Center in Krein. In Krein. All of them, all and their of them, commitment, and their commitment, the work, the work, are guarantors, are guarantors for a successful, for a successful project. project. Dr. Casali Dr. has Casali already has referred to the goals of this, this conference. conference. This conference. Economic, success Economic success is based not least, based on, not an least on an intensive understanding, understanding of, current of current trends, of current trends and, tendencies. and tendencies. Ceramics, ceramics the material the material that wonderfully, that combines wonderfully combines tradition, tradition and modernity. And modernity. It Enables functional design as well as forward as well as forward experiments. Experiments. The technical possibilities, the technical possibilities in terms of mass, terms of mass shape, or decor, shape, or decor, can always can be challenged always anew. Be challenged anew. This means this means that something new. That something new is always being created. Always being created. This is this what makes is ceramics, what makes so, ceramics fascinating. so fascinating. In the end, in the end, it is the customer, is the who, decides customer who decides on the economic success, success. Economic success. today. Today, every service, every has, service to keep him has to keep in mind. Him in mind. The, conference the conference will give us some, ideas, give us some ideas on how creativity, on how creativity and, profitability and profitability can be brought into, harmony. Be brought into harmony. We look forward, we look forward to stimulating the discussion, stimulating discussion with, intensive with intensive participation. Please all, please take, all the opportunity take the opportunity to question, to question competent, speakers. competent speakers. Thanks to the MIC, thanks to the MIC and its team and for, its the organization, team for the organization, to the other partners, to the other for, partners the support, for the support. I wish, I wish the event, the event much, success, much success and lasting impact. Thank you. So thank you, Mrs. Uh, Livetsky, for uh, this uh, uh, introduction. Uh, of course, it was uh, supposed uh, to have uh, this conference uh, in uh, presence, but uh, due to the pandemic situation, uh, we are forced uh, to organize it online. And uh, friends from uh, Selve, Ilbenau, Ljubljana, St. Polten, Boleslaviet, uh, Pilsen, Krani, uh, they would have uh, come uh, to visit us in Faenza and uh, to participate in this conference. And, uh, but uh, uh, they are online and uh, uh, my greetings uh, go to, to them. Then uh, we will start uh, this uh, long uh, day of uh, uh, conference. Uh, starting with uh, uh, Massimo Isola, uh, who is uh, the mayor of uh, Faenza, but also the president of the Italian uh, uh, Cities of Ceramic and the European Cities of Ceramic Association. So he will uh, give us uh, uh, an overview of the situation of ceramics in Italy and in Europe. And I thank him for his presence. And as uh, you probably know, uh, he was uh, also uh, the councillor for ceramic in the Faenza uh, municipality for the last 10 years. Now Massimo is... Okay. Uh, good morning. Good morning to everyone. First, I wish uh, to thank the International Museum of Ceramics Foundation and uh, Claudia Casali organized this uh, conference within the European CERDE project, inviting experts, designers, professors to develop a reflection about the future of ceramics between tradition and innovation. Uh, 
as president of the Italian and European Association of Cities of Ceramics, I have to say that uh, this is a topic we have been dealing with since many years. Our stakeholders are the cities with an ancient and acknowledged ceramic tradition in art and craft. Cities for which ceramics represent a fundamental element of their cultural identity. Even before being, of course, an element of their economical and productive life. These are cities where the production started centuries ago, when you can find the ceramic workshops, ateliers, schools, museums, market fairs and festivals, awards and prizes, libraries and specialized magazines. We strongly believe that uh, this tradition can be enhanced only through innovation. Our projects and activities, both in Italy and in Europe, are designed in this direction. I often say that our ceramists need to speak both their local dialect and fluent English. This is to say that they need uh, to develop their work, keeping a connection with their cultural roots, but uh, with great openness to the world and to the different ways of producing and considering ceramics. This was uh, true before COVID-19, but is even more so in the light of the effects of the pandemic. Ceramists are not only builders of objects, but every day they build stories, narrations, identity. They talk about the tradition of a community, but also of the evolution of lifestyles through everyday objects, like a dish or a mug. They talk about our life, as uh, the new amazing permanent section of the International Museum of Ceramics in Faenza, dedicated to popular ceramics and design presented to the public last week, tell us. For us, talking about ceramics means talking about our civilization and our communities. Ceramic production has an economic dimension, of course, but it also absorbs an idea of the world, the passage of time, steals and habits. But to be incisive, ceramic production needs to be up to date and to reflect contemporary time and its changes. The experience of COVID-19 has accelerated the change of our time. Our ceramists have struggled with the closure of workshops and with the decrease of the demand, without a doubt. We will see the effects of the crisis for many years onwards, but I have to say that many of them have been able to use this difficult situation to create something new. Some have uh, developed new production and collection. Some have focused on the marketing, especially developing e-commerce platform. Some have started new collaborations with artists and designers. And as for my experience, this has met the request of the public. In the, cost, in, the, in the context of Faenza, for instance, last year we had uh, to cancel Argilla Italia, the International Ceramics Festival and Market Fair, due to the pandemic. To fill that void, we organized a smaller ceramic market fair with 100 Italian ceramics, called Made in Italy. 
It was a game ball, but unexpectedly, we won it. Made in Italy 2020 was a great success for the participating ceramists in terms of sales also and also for the public that uh, was longing to see and buy high quality ceramics for all over Italy. Carolina Betnors, young and talented, with one of the speakers today, was one of the exhibitors of Made in Italy and is a perfect example of a ceramic a ceramist that has faced the pandemic developing new styles and objects using that period to study and to experiment with brilliant results. Another example from Faenza is uh, the temporary shop of ceramics that we opened last year during the Christmas period for the sixth consecutive year. We decided to open it, uh, even if the pandemic was not over to give a positive sign of hope to our citizen and uh, to the ceramists, of course. And for from every possible forecast, it was the best year in terms of visits to the shop and sales, despite the many days of closure we had to respect. These are just some little examples, but I strongly believe that today, especially after the pandemic experience, people need stories, need objects that tell stories. And ceramics have always been able to do this. In this context, the contamination between design and ceramics has a structural value in the changing market and we need an innovative ceramic system which knows how to question itself and which focuses more and more not only on how to make ceramics but on what to produce and why. Design culture and processes are fundamental for ceramic production because ceramics have to produce new object combining function, shape, decoration within a story, always keeping in mind market rules and mechanisms. I am sure that ceramists that accept the challenge of change, crossing past and present and combining the fields of design art and craftsmanship will, a, will be able to overcome this difficult period and develop in the future the tradition from which they originate. Thank you very much. Thank you Massimo for uh, your uh, inspiring speech and uh, we talk about ceramic as uh, tradition lifestyle project but especially contemporary time all the cities of ceramics in italy and in europe try to support this very difficult uh, period the historical period with efforts ideas and new projects just to face and to overcome the challenge we are facing so thank you very much for uh, your overview and uh, now we will uh, uh, pass the word to Jacques uh, Kaufmann, uh, who is a very well-known uh, artist uh, and uh, teacher. And uh, uh, he, he was involved and he is involved in many important uh, international projects, um, especially uh, starting from his base in Geneva, but also in France, in China. And we know how he was, uh, he joined different international uh, projects that involved uh, ceramic artists and ceramic production. And currently he is uh, the honorary president of the International Academy of Ceramics. 
and um, he will uh, um, talk about the new possibilities in ceramic art and design after COVID. So Jacques, the word is to you and thank you for your presence and for your speech. Thank you, thank you, Claudia. Uh, dear audience, dear guests, um, um, well, today I am invited more as uh, uh, to represent IEC and uh, uh, how we face uh, this uh, period of time uh, than as an artist myself, so I will not show anything from my work. Uh, so here we are in terms of certitudes. Thank you for sharing. My best thanks to FANZA International Ceramic Museum and the organizers of this series of lectures today. I will talk today about ceramic in our time and the lightning of its functions, values, and potentials. I gave two subtitles to this talk. They will arise at the conclusion, an incarnate time and the emotional added value. I will have no time today to speak about trend disciplinary that I see as an important way for innovation. It will be maybe for another session. COVID-19 has affected not only people's bodies and minds, but also social and economic activities, including of course culture in all its aspects from making to ways to share. In only one sentence, ceramic, art, design, architecture will not save the world, but can contribute and serve for a better world in terms of value and responsibilities. We are now at the point to question, yes, we can, and include criteria related to shared responsibilities facing sustainable activities. By the way, do you have a real job? Is a long-term question the role of art, artist in the society. In this period, is it acceptable to be seen as not essential? Um, sorry. We will see later what is our space and role in the frame of human needs, but first, Let's have a quick tour in the past. To tame God's symbolic needs, needs for spiritual protection, this lasts for 29,000 years. Since the origin of ceramic activities, three essential branches emerge to address the needs of humanity and remain active today. In order of appearance in time, artifacts for the spiritual needs were developed to honor the gods and get their protection, followed by items related to daily life usage, and finally clay material for architecture. Needs of daily life, food, cleanliness, 13,000 years ago, jars for life and also sometimes for death. It means that ceramic basically is a heavy material not only at physical, but metaphorical level. In between vessel, architecture and body, we can see here the symbolic function. And then the need of physical protection through architecture. We make break since 12,000 years before Christus. I mean, fired bricks. Here you can have the oldest fire brick of the world collected at Ashmolean Museum, Oxford, about 10 kilo of clay. So we shared this uninterrupted history from 29,000 years ago to now, where ceramic as a medium has found ways to serve human needs at large and hopefully will continue. Each of these three branches require today the interrogation of practitioners how to actively inherit what updated contribution to this long story is possible. Here we can see one, two. Jacques, could you, could you take away the paper from the microphone because uh, it is, uh, there is a noise. 
And okay. could you put the presentation uh, as presentation? And uh, because we we see the frame of uh, of the PPT. If okay. you like, no problem. Okay. This way is better. Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Briefly now, introduction to the IEC. Please visit the website. IEC is an institution created in 1952 and actually an NGO partner of UNESCO since 1959. Among the activities, biennial congresses, participation in juries in international competitions, support for international ceramic activities, and so on. In its mission, uh, the goal of the IEC is to stimulate friendship and communication between professionals in the field of ceramic in all countries. The IEC develop and encourage all forms of international cooperation to promote ceramic and to encourage and maintain production at the highest level of quality in all ceramic culture. You can see on the right a newborn project, the Ceramic World Destination, to provide information about ceramic all around the world. About the membership, we have around 8,080 8, members from about 74 countries. The membership structure has changed to now consist of makers at large, writers, collectors, curators, galleries, as individual members and collective members as museum, residencies, professional association, universities, and so on. Congresses and General Assembly are a place for debates, including national and international exhibitions, lectures related to a specific theme, which should be at best of local and global interest. With the COVID, it is more particularly the, letter, the letters I and C, international and ceramic, that have been impacted. Indeed, what does international mean in a context where nothing can move? As for ceramics, an art with a strong haptic component, what does a virtual visit to an exhibition or a museum mean? What experience can you expect from it? It was necessary for the IEC to invent, as a matter of urgency, solution to face the present moment knowing that the impact will continue in this world that we quickly named the world after. Among the first reaction and consequences, it is a virtualization of exchanges that has taken power, the virtual world becoming the new norm, as an answer to nonetheless pursue activities which could, which could involve and connect our members, albeit in another form. For example, Online executive and board meetings have become the norm. Likewise, some regional meetings between members have been set up. Here, the group of Latin America members. We had to postpone and cancel our face-to-face -face congress scheduled for Rovaniemi, Lapland in 2020, to finally give it a new but virtual form in fall 2021. It has been the same for the 2022 Geneva Congress, which is already being designed in a hybrid form, on-site and online. We can therefore see that a new balance must be invented, particularly for an institution which, with an international vocation in the relationship between global and local. And of course, hybrid is about 50% more as expensive to a normal Congress. Not to mention, of course, uh, the online conferencing offered by Fine Science International Ceramic Museum for its international competition recently. I would like to mention particularly uh, one experience, one initiative called Quartz Inversion. That uh, Quartz Inversion means a moment of change implemented by two artists at the start, Adil Writer in India and Janet Abrams in USA, asking two artists to testify on their reflection, action and creation in the beginning of COVID. 
the guest artist in turn has to recommend one or two artists as the viral expansion of the circle. So please visit the website and you can see um, uh, how artists reacted uh, um, uh, during this, uh, the start of this period. Unfortunately, this experience is now uh, uh, not moving on, lack of finance to, to, to make it possible to enlarge the circle. Then we have new IC member exhibition and seminar hosted by Gojong Museum in Beijing. Uh, he should have been an uh, exhibition in present. It was not possible. So in keywords, this seminar, we spoke about interculturality in this moment, about tools and techniques, about body and languages. If it is not the role of the artist, if it is not the role of the artist to solve problems, it is in their power to investigate, articulate, propose, link imaginary and reality, which are, is already a way for a response. There is no best title, as when attitude becomes form, an exhibition by Harald Zeman in 1969. In a renewed perspective, it connects Ramik to social movements, socially engaged practices, research on material and processes, and links between tradition and innovation for ceramic industry, art, and craft. Online events can be enlarged with all kinds of relevant themes, lecturers and formats, interview, debates, lectures, and so on. And about on-site and online exhibition, the second cannot replace the first, but can enlarge the vision and potential exchanges as far as possible we should try to act locally and share globally. The on-site exhibition and seminar, for it, it happened that about only 50 people were live on-site present in the room for the seminar and opening of the exhibition. 100 people assisted live online, allowing the possibility to get simultaneous translation, English, Chinese, and to participate to the live chat. And if my numbers are correct, it is 23 million people who could see the lectures and discussion afterwards by broadcasting. This opened new doors and, of course, responsibility for this kind of event. As a reaction within the IEC uh, to the COVID, it was to imagine a working group named GTT for Green Think Tank to consider how with a little insight and in a spirit of responsibility to give meaning to the COVID present time and to see what direction and action to take collectively. The answers will take time, particularly when for certain subjects, the involvement of the collective is desirable and desired. To question the format of the Congress and General Assembly, is one of the important topics we have on our table. To evaluate responsibility facing intercultural exchanges, sustainability, ceramic values, and contribution. And what actions, what action we can promote from our members and from the world, from the ceramic world. As actions, few examples. Uh, about research and application based on material and processes I have met recently. Number one is a startup based in the suburb of Paris. Name is Ipsis. Uh, they can make foam with lots of materials, of minerals. The bubbles are interconnected. On the left, you can see that the material can absorb a lot of water, double his weight and has high isolation uh, capacity for kiln materials. It is light. It can be hydrophil or water repellent, depending on the surface you want to provide. And I made a test in my studio. Uh, after one year, you can see that the plant I put just on the bricks, and the bricks taking the water from the plate can feed the plant. 
So I believe that for creation, innovation, the research on materials is fundamental. Example number two is a brick factory in Gujarat, India. You can see this beautiful landscape uh, of storage there before sending in the here and there. They have a Hoffman kiln, produce the brick manually. And uh, this was the first factory I met connected to bricks and with this production in, in India. And then I met the boss of a company which recycle oil industry waste. And here you have a picture of this waste uh, waiting for recycling. Here is a process. And after the process, here's some product ready for reuse, including in the oil industry. So this is a kind of so-called virtual circle. But there is a final waste after recycling. And this final waste is 10 tons a day that has to be put into the ground day after day. And the boss told me, OK, Jacques, can, can we do something with this waste? Uh, so I asked for the description of the material. And I see it was a kind of Sega formula that this material maybe could fit into the clay before firing and then be neutralized by the firing and, uh, and uh, maybe provide some uh, uh, specific uh, qualities to the bricks. That we did. And 10 tons of a day of waste compared to 400 tons a day of production of bricks, it's only 2.5% of a material that can help the brick to fire at lower temperature. And it did, it worked. But and fortunately, they didn't follow after um, uh, uh, the successful test, uh, even if uh, the quality of the brick were better at the same temperature after firing. And the second but is indeed in our world, I would like to say the past world, most of the bricks are going to England and this is probably no more acceptable in the future. The third example, so it is again in a brick factory here in Portugal. In the project, nothing special, but of course they have also some waste. And this waste are recycled and put into the production again. The brick is produced with a minimum ratio in between material and volume. And they decided to limit the temperature of firing to what is relevant. It means that they don't go to the limit of the firing what the clay can accept. The best for now, all the energy for kilns and machine is provided by agric agricultural waste transform in gas and electricity. The electricity surplus is sent to the general electricity network of the country. I don't have time now to present an historical approach of arts and crafts, starting with men using tools and, main, and, and, and making tools. The tool is what makes anthropologists speak of, you, of human in terms of homo faber, the man who makes, more appropriate to describe the human being than Homo sapiens, the thinking human. They think, and I'll join them, that it is because I don't, I do that I can think. By making tools, it becomes possible to act more, to transform, to produce, to be. I do, therefore I am, should we say. In this sense, Mastering the fire as a tool was a major step in human evolution, in its transformation, and subse subsequently in the transformation of its environment. In this sense, working with clay, transforming it by fire, allows the production of secondary tools for humanity, whether it is a sculpture, tool for devotion, a jar, tool for food preservation, or a brick, tool for building a shelter.
here. It is, of course, also inevitable to be confronted today to the time of tools, time and tools of industry. Two questions arise very quickly. What about the replacement of the men by machine and robots? How does the time of the maker manifest itself in his practice in the perception what we can have of an incarnate time? The time related to the contemporary epoch is complex. We are immersed in that time with the difficulty of taking a fair distance with it. In front of the wall, let's go faster. This is actually a safe ironic vision of our society seen from the angle of the environmental questions. The distance of the impact becomes bigger and bigger, time shorter and shorter, the result is that the speed gets crazy and wealth as well as energy. This requires always more energetic slaves at our service. My perception is that today we are living in a fragmented time, without direction, without a role, imposing on being to be always ready, curiously, to follow the most urgent impulse, the injunction of always more, in quantities and performances. This perhaps signal, signals a form of madness of the epoch when time is only instant, which becomes the absolute master. When it imposes on the bodies and the spirit a speed which is a numerical one, this speed is, in my opinion, far from the need of beings in terms of duration and feelings. The consciousness of being here and now allows the enjoyment of the moment. Time becoming only instant, because confronted with speed, takes the form of permanent saccade. The duration is lost. The cannibal society is the one where desires are so high that nothing can stop them, including and ending by eating oneself. In the 1950s, being modern meant that sciences and technology will provide a new and wonderful world, what do we think now about it? Yes, we can. Let's go back to this slogan made famous by Obama and indeed taken from a song published in 1970s by Lee Dorsey, an American black singer. A designer in communication and social imaginary advised President Barack Obama while he was a primary candidate in 2008 to use these three simple keywords yes, we can, to translate a political positioning, position, po positive thinking, collective approach, skills, ability. Yes, it's positive. We is inclusive and collective. Can is power, competence, the capacity to think and act towards reality. But thinking more in depth, the word can has to be questioned. It is not because I can do something that I have to do it or that it is relevant to do it. It requires criteria to evaluate its different aspects and impacts and when necessary to decide for self-limitation. And this is not easy. Anthropocene is the impact of human activities not only on the climate but at the geological level of the planet. Production means materials, energy, and waste. Here, some bricks slowly going back to origins. What means emotional added value? Let's take an example. When you have a plate or a bowl and when you break it by accident, what would you feel? Any pain or is it just boring because you have to clean the kitchen full of broken pieces? The emotional added value is a value carried by an object which, when we cannot enjoy it anymore, will affect us, for example, by sadness, loneliness. So an object, an environment, a building, is not only related to its functional value, but also by other functions and values, more spiritual, including memories and affects. In any object, carrying emotions or not, in any case, there is material, energy, time, skills involved. How to take care of that? So the poetic energy is a possibility to activate in us an emotional value. Bachelard said, 
the craftsman elaborate an universe with his material and process. We all know that in our daily lives when we work, with the conscious or unconscious goal to provide a feeling of embodied time. I would like to illustrate for you an example about the concept of break in values in our society. Before COVID-19, of course, I had the amazing following experience in a foot massage, a re relaxing time. Receiving a text message, the, the woman in charge of my feet, without any hesitation, started to answer to the mobile phone. What? Massage, as I understand it, is an art and craft based practice connected, connecting bodies, energies, requiring skills. This small event, and I'm not very thankful that it happened, showed to me that a break of values, a break in the relationship with the materials, and material in that case is me, during the process we can feel that something is related to the ethics of the work during the process of making. This represents a value connecting human and work at deep level. Human needs. At level one, we have the short-term physical needs connected to immediate survival. Air, three minutes, water, three days, food, three weeks, sleep, three weeks. At level two, we find the need for safety, the need for love at level three and belonging to a group. Level four, need of esteem, including self-esteem. And level five, need of self-actualization, creativity, problem solving, acceptation of facts. Different researchers about human needs, here Maslow and Rosenberg, they spoke about need of survival, need of relation, rational nurture and affect, need of autonomy, need of integrity, need of self-expression, mental needs, social needs, spiritual needs, celebration of life needs. Human needs can be put in relation with our perception, emotion and feelings. In one of Leonard Cohen's most famous song, Hallelujah, he said, and I quote, I couldn't feel, so I learned to touch. Perception. We are always in contact with our perception from inside our body and from outside the world. Emotions are involved in art, craft, design. So maybe the urgency today is about feeling, all kinds of feeling, touch, proximity, sensibility. What role can play ceramic at large in our environment in this context? Needs, appetites, and desires to please the brain of emotion. Modern science, especially neuroscience, demonstrates the links between needs, appetites, and desires in one hand, and the response that the brain develops and communicates to the body when these needs and desires are satisfied or not. This is how a mapping of the brain of emotion has been established on which we can see our affect, joy, and sadness. When beauty can be everywhere, connected to nature, inside culture, it is the role of the artist to reveal it. Of course, each culture defines its own criteria for beauty. Without entering in a deep discussion now about multicultural approaches on beauty, there is a book, Five Meditation on Beauty by Francois Cheng, that demonstrate, if necessary, that without beauty, life has no meaning and interest. It means that beauty in our lives is a basic need. Human needs are questioned in our contemporary world when spaces are less and less connected to nature. What about material which fulfill their functional role of use but no other? Can they provide the condition for life in good condition? From consume more and quickly to consume better it requires to collectively define what means better, which include the quality which cares, I mean the emotional quality, which can be resumed through the concept of material consciousness, another topic for discussion. Anyway, consume more instead of better is not sustainable. Remember, in front of the wall, let's go faster. 
So human needs in question, here we are. And for the last slide, Thank you. Thank you, Jacques, for uh, your uh, presentation. You give us uh, different uh, examples of uh, action for the reaction uh, to this uh, uh, historical uh, situation we are facing. And uh, you show us um, how uh, the community of uh, Ceramic World uh, proposed different actions uh, and uh, just to keep in contact and just uh, to create something uh, more uh, a kind of consciousness. And um, I really appreciate your uh, starting with uh, this uh, idea of ceramic as a heavy material, not just for uh, its weight, of course, but uh, uh, for what it means in terms of uh, history, tradition, project, ideas, and uh, especially future. And uh, your proposition of uh, uh, this um, idea of a, a green way of uh, protecting and of thinking of uh, ceramics is very important. And uh, yes, we can uh, make a difference uh, with a different approach. And um, what is important in all the fields is uh, uh, the consciousness and uh, res the responsibility of uh, our action in all the fields, not just for ceramic, but uh, in general. In, uh, in this very moment, uh, we are facing a very uh, difficult uh, um, perception of the future and we have to act uh, for protecting our future and for protecting especially our uh, health. So, um, I uh, see many uh, compliments on the chat and uh, for, for your speech and for uh, this uh, conference. And uh, uh, Jacques, it's the first time that you are on time. <laughs> we <laughs> so it is uh, not, uh, we, we didn't waste any, any, any time and uh, we are in advance. And uh, I have just a question for uh, for you, for uh, because I, we know that uh, and you presented also some project that you are working on. And uh, do you have a special project, uh, in, including this green idea for your work yes. at the moment? Yes. Do you want me to answer now? Okay. Yes, I have uh, several projects, including Green Walls project. Uh, which is a research I started uh, uh, maybe eight or uh, ten years ago with uh, a university in Geneva for architecture and landscape architecture, where I worked together with uh, within a group with one architect, one landscape architect, one specialist of soil, one specialist of plants, and we developed a green wall uh, against uh, the green washing. Uh, that uh, very often we can see in uh, in um, uh, in different uh, situations, and this project will be developed. And there is uh, uh, actually a proposition to implement this green wall um, in the Swiss Embassy in Beijing. Um, and indeed, uh, this research uh, now is public. Uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, uh, I would say this research was successful, but the business behind was not so uh, easy by the company who bought the patent for it. But to develop this, we'll need uh, uh, again one uh, 30 minutes lecture, so I will not take this time. But I would like to, 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 to give you uh, uh, one, um, one example of the 
um, of the weight of clay. My wife is a storyteller. And we can see that there is myths, all many myths of creation about the universe, the planet, the man, before Christianism and Jewish and Muslim. They all borrow to clay, the immediate connection in between life, human, and clay. So that's why I say it is a, a, a very heavy material, a psychological, spiritual material uh, level, you know. And we have to take this in account. We are clay, indeed. Thank you very much. We are clay. It will be a, a motto that we will use. Thank you. And uh, now we pass the, the word uh, to Giovanna Cassese, who is the president of uh, ISEA. Uh, so another topic of this uh, conference, uh, so education, and uh, we will talk about uh, uh, what challenge for the future, for what concern uh, the education in, uh, in design. Before giving her the word, I, I'd like to, to tell something about uh, Giovanna. Uh, she is uh, an expert in the world of higher education in the arts. She has worked assiduously to ensure that uh, the University of Design in France becomes an important university center for, of national reference for the training of future designers, uh, bringing action back to ceramic design. But uh, she is not just focused uh, on uh, influenza, but uh, of course, uh, she worked uh, in the Academy of Naples and uh, she, uh, she is uh, um, a correspondent and a reference for the Ministry of uh, the Italian Education. So thank you, Giovanna, for being uh, with us. And uh, I pass you the, the word, and, uh, be, but before we will see a short uh, video uh, concerning Isia Faenza. Thank you, Claudia. Yes, if you want to say something about this beautiful building, uh, uh, because we yes, don't have a uh, music. Um, first, I would like to thank you really uh, and salute all the ISEA because I would like to salute the director, Concetta Cossa, the professor Concetta Cossa, all the students, all the professor. is a very important moment for ISEA of France. We changed a lot of uh, things with the previous director, Marinella Paderni, that I salute. Uh, and. Um, I am very happy to stay here with you, and you are uh, seeing a lot of projects that we um, made in these years, in the last years, four years. Uh, we were present in Salone del Mobile in Milan. We organized a lot of uh, exhibition. One very important, thank you, Claudia, in the Museum uh, of International Ceramics, Builders of Tomorrow, Dialogue Between Art and Design. And uh, now we are organizing a big project. And maybe we are going to open a master. No, maybe, sure. But uh, maybe this year, uh, the first master in ceramics. And um, in design ceramics. And we are going to organize in uh, autumn a big uh, congress, international congress, about the theme. Because uh, we are the first, the only institution in Italy that um, we have a degree, the first level and second level in design, in ceramic design. So um, I think um, this moment, this epochal moment is really important and we have to think about uh, this ancient material but is so contemporary and I am sure that this material has got a very good, a very big future. So, this is the last uh, project that we um, organized in Faenza last week. So you are seeing um, the space and we open a big, uh, uh, not a big, but an important uh, library dedicated to Bruno Murari. And so 
I would like to to speak today about uh, the great challenge that we have in education in art and design, a theme that uh, our um, Italy uh, lost uh, lost the importance of this theme. So I would like to start, and uh, my theme is uh, beyond the border design, heritage, and vision of for the future for a new education in design. The world of design is an intrinsic part of the heritage and express Italy's identity. The heritage to be preserved and expanded is a legacy of ideas and projects, objects and images, knowledge and experience, a material and immaterial inheritance that strongly defines Italians around the world. The true core, core of Italy's identity is the union between beauty, creativity, culture, whose points of excellence are condensed in the field of design. These values have made Italy famous around the globe. With the new millennium and the new scenario of globalization, a multiplicity of interacting phenomena such as the spread of digital technologies and the growth of virtual industry, the need for an ecological awareness, are rapidly modifying the traditional notion of design and now is really old to speak about industrial design. The very essence of design has always focused on the future. Artists and designers have always prefigured the future in their works and vision. The artists, architects, designers of a century ago, during the vital and highly focused era of the historic avant-garde movement, are at the very root of our lives. The year 2019 marked one the 100th anniversary for the Bauhaus. This displayed an ethical concept for the arts and a clear vision of the future, not without its topias founded on dialogue between artists, craftsmen, designers, between beauty, form, and function. A vision free of hierarchies based on capacity to experiment, to develop research, to innovate. The spirit of Bauhaus inspired the creation of the Sia in Italy. In particular, Isia Faenza, characterized by its extremely fruitful dialogue between theoretical, scientific, technical, laboratory based, laboratory based disciplines, where research, innovation, experimentation constitute the fulcrum of a virtuous approach to teaching for rigidly programmed numbers of students. Is a community, our ISIA. 100 years ago, after the foundation of Bauhaus, thinking about the School of Art and Design, renews the question about the education of designers. In the post era, the Bauhaus model is extremely actual. Ursula von der Leyen, presenting the innovative challenges for the new European Green Deal, in, this, in his address on the state in the Union, 2020 market. We will set up a new European Bauhaus, a co creation space where architects, artists, students, engineers, designers work together. And added, I want next generation EU to start a wave of restructuring across Europe and make the Union the leader of the circular economy. But it's not just an environmental or economic project. It must be a new European cultural project. The new European Bauhaus is a creative interdisciplinary initiative that brings together a meeting space to design future ways of living, located at the crossroads of art, culture, social inclusion, science, and technology. It brings the Green Deal to the upper place of life and requires a collective effort to imagine and, and build a sustainable, inclusive, and beautiful future for the earth and mind. Bauhaus is the model for the future of green Europe, and Ursula believes in the great potential of art and design, but she believes in educational in art and design 
to plan a better world in a multidisciplinary way. She, she chooses a, a school. Bauhaus is an archetype for the school and the University of the Zone. We are living absolutely dramatic moments in Italy in the field of agri education in art, as the political agenda is chosen not to focus on the question of education, of teaching art and design. But I always consider it essential today to adopt a political position in the world of agri education in art and design to contribute to create a concrete Respublica and following Maldonado, we must always be by recovering the design of that is rebuilding our confidence in the revolutionary function of applied rationality on new foundation. Teaching design for the third millennium is based on contamination and cultural interconnection. Indeed, Many of us not only leave our activities as scholars, intellectuals, designers, artists, but are also asked to personally play a political part in the educational institution in which we work. So, it is essential and really urgent that we form a critical mass. If design is a project and a vision for the future, we must set out from the movement of education an essential ganglion able to affect an entire system. The moment of education is central. The builders of tomorrow are precisely the young people we teach today, our greatest material and material resource, those who we dedicate our attention and care each day with a great responsibility, a very great responsibility every day. The future is dedicated to them, to the young. A future that is not only existential, but also social, ethical, political, cultural. In reality, to continue guaranteeing Italy's primary role in art and design, we must begin with the teaching and vice versa. Educational Education is an integral and essential part of the contemporary system. This is the perspective from which to read Paolo De Canello, um, extraordinary lucid booklet, Design Politico, a true manifesto centered on education. In our world in which Arctic is expanded, the boundaries between disciplines are really less, less rigid. Designers, artists, and architects seek one another out and collaborate physically and metaphorically. They also dialogue with scientists and philosophers. Design is inherently transversal to humanist and scientific knowledge, precisely like art, and in recent decades, it is developed a new in a complex practice that includes an infinity of materials, technology, know-how, practice, and skill. It involves products, service, process. Involves our life. The real term is how to move beyond the boundary between art and design to promote the dialogue between the culture of design and the culture of creativity a new, for a new aesthetic and in a post-industrial industrial era. We must discover and rediscover the correspondence and the assonance comprising the legacy of Italy's, Italy's identity in this field. This is the very DNA of the Made in Italy, which earned us international recognition as creator of iconic objects for the past 50 years. On this tema, we organized just the exhibition that I said, the Builders of Tomorrow. Earlier education in art and uh, the SIA particular with their history and culture, and play, they continue to play a determinant role despite the absolute fragility of this equilibrium, especially in Italy. The change, the change however, is precisely to safeguard such exceptional know-how to benefit the future. Therefore, we must image a new and more intense dialogue between the arts, restoring importance to history, to favor an educational model, focused on critical skills that forms mm, the well-made head, uh, as said Edgar Morin. 
education must be aligned with the real needs and the new millennium. And first, this is really important, theoretical and, uh, theoretical and humanistic discipline, such as uh, the history of art, history of design, aesthetics, philosophy, anthropology, are essential to the education of designers for the future. Only if we are able to overcome an engineering-based and technical vision of education. They can integrate an education in science, technique, and technology to form a truly contemporary design. Edgar Morin invited us to reflect on just how essential it is to educate and re-educate in aesthetics because the teaching of humanistic subject is not a luxury, a luxury but be redimensioned to the advantage of a practical lesson, lessons. It is indispensable and advantageous for a full, for full life. European Year of Cultural Heritage has recently concluded with the motto, the motto our heritage where the past meets the, meets the future. This is the vital concept that we must use to develop a reflection also on innovation in the field of education in design. Following the current health emergency, it is likely design to need to restart. The Italian design system in education counts on, on different and, and diffuse networks based primarily in the north part of the peninsula. Wishing to simplify, we can count at least three typologies for, firstly, the ISEA. The ISEA created in 1970 as the first public university institution dedicated only and specifically to an education of design. Then Italy universities in 19 with School of Architecture, and the university at the end of the second millennium were followed by fine art academies that now also fine art academies forms designers. These public institutions were then joined by now in uh, an explosion of a private school, more or less recognized by the Ministry of University and Research. There are more than 100 schools in Milan, for example, private. But the education of a design is often closely linked with the local productive fabric and of each territory. And it is always necessary to maintain a particular relationship with local culture and productive, productive heritage. The way for Italy to live behind the crisis must be that founded on creativity, on national heritage and the genius logic as value of civility and liberty capable of act activating economic supply chains and design is all of its various divisions in uh, the privileged sector. This year have their own specific vocation for their close ties with the productive needs of their territories. In particular, Isia Faenza was created thanks to the effort of a pool of important artists and intellectuals. Was finding fathers included Bruno Munari, Andrea Emiliani, Matteo Zauli from the world of ceramics design. Faenza name is, uh, itself speaks of, of this DNA and this genius logic. To date, it is the only higher education institution in Italy to issue a level first diploma in ceramic design and a, a second level diploma, diploma in advanced materials. Also in um, design of communication now, but uh, is the only institution that uh, um, issue a degree in ceramic design. We are, and we are now opening this new master. We are equally convinced of the need to respect this history, the history, the genius logic, including the skill of artists and craftsmen, the knowledge of material technique, passed down through generation, the skill of the hands. Um, Andrea Emiliani wrote a book, The Skill of the Hands. Besides 
Aesthetics and formal aspects are a specific characteristic of Italian design, thanks to a traditional capability to overcome disciplinary boundaries between art, architecture, craftsmanship. Today, a new pact between artists, designers, and artisans favors the contaminated production of forms and objects and evoke new emotion and suggestion. Works and objects that refer one to the other, that draw on the lesson of the past and which are the fruit of intersecting points of view and practice. The question also in the field of teaching concerns how to fully overcome the concept of industrial design and include design increasing more within the field of cultural, cultural and creative industries. A true heritage and driving force of Italy for their social, cultural, ethic, and economic value. Higher education must develop a dedication to a design as the design of the world and the cultural inheritance spanning the past and the future. Additionally, the distinction between product design, communication design, appears to, to have lost its meaning and being overcome by the complexity of the present, by the continuous interaction between the various aspects of design. Today, the ethical function of design is increasingly clearer for a more just and ecologic, sustainable world. There is a return to the important events of a moment such as good design after the Second War. In this sense, it, <clears throat> uh, this is a, the epochal challenge calling out the most young designers who respond with awareness and skill to truly change the map of goods and service. Bruno Murari, a master forever suspended between art and design and gifted such, with such polytechnic skill, had already taught the way toward an education in beauty and design. He went as far as proposing a school of design that began in the nursery because, he said, everyone sees what they know. He wrote, and this, uh, this is the true point, focusing on culture also and above to the educated, to the professional and professionals of the future and spread the conscious and awareness. With this uh, mind, in the Sia Faenza, inaugurated the first library of design in the region Emilia Romagna, inside the ancient, have you seen the ancient and secluded space of Palazzo Mazzolani? The library is dedicated to none another than Bruno Munari, the school's founding father and inspirer for a polyedric research for the development of creativity and fantasy. Munari was a precursor featuring a constantly new way to looking at and making objects with fantasy, imagination, levity, and memory. He made a great contribution to the pedagogy of, pedagogy of design, providing a phenomenological interpretation so that one thing leads to another. Opening a library is a political act in an in a institution. It's a very difficult. Opening a library, placing heritage with a network, stimulating acquisition through donation and purchase, signifies choosing a, police, a policy of culture that demands ad hoc investment to create a beautiful and welcoming space, to encourage and encounter silence of study and dialogue between students inside the fascinating historic space enriched by the comfort of contemporary technologies and furnish. The intention is to highlight the, and offer a new space for the use of this heritage of books, part of the SBN network. This material heritage also became, became, becomes immaterial. It is transformed from history into an incubator for the future. In this way, even an heritage book becomes essential to education of a designer and library, like archives represent space, space for excellence for this. The library and archives are really necessary in our institution, but in Italy it's not so easy to have this. To conclude, 
I would like to focus on five key words for anyone operating in the world of higher education today. Five words. Courage, research, innovation, memory, and future. Courage is necessary every day, above in uh, all in educational institutions, to ensure informed choice, in some cases countercurrent, or pace to face incredible funding cuts and myopic policy. Very myopic. There is a need for a courage to fight because I believe that Italy is responsible for defending and promoting higher education in art and design. In the proper sense of the term, believing in young artists, believing in the younger designers, while they are students, through concrete action signifies believing in the future and in those who are building this future. This brings us to research and production. Research and production is very important in our institution. Two inherent aspects of the institutional mission of higher education in art. While they cannot absolutely overlap, they must be strongly stimulated. We must imagine that the designers, like the artists, is in, in an, an intellectual. This means rethinking the status of discipline and perhaps even the specific statute of its course, because at the time when Italy must rethink itself and reprogram its future, I believe it's also time to remodulate the curricula of study. I believe in this moment, and I strongly combat for this every day, also tomorrow, I believe that uh, for higher education in art, la, the creation of a PhD in design and art, we don't have, is impossible that Italy is the only country in Europe that don't have PhD. And in the figurative arts, because PhD is a fundamental and culminating moment in education in the third millennium. Research must be communicated with catalog, print, and digital publication through relations with the press and principally with the specialist review. Research must be provided the tools for sharing results in order to communicate and verify them. All of this means a great deal of work which requires energy, passion, and desire to collaborate and the dialogue. A meeting. Yet I am convinced that the between our professor and students there is no shortage of any of this in our institution. This is the only way to truly produce innovation. The memory of design represents our immense heritage. And this is the memory is important, but the memory for the future. That is not only material, but also immaterial. It must be developed through research innovation and preserved for the future in accordance with the FARO Convention. FARO Convention is important, very important for the uh, education and also education in art. In this sense, I have already advanced my own proposal some years ago to the ministry to place the academies and the DCA and the institution of uh, either formation in art, uh, archetype, of how to teach the art in the list of UNESCO World Heritage. Today, beyond object, we must also safeguard the vast immaterial heritage of Italian artistic know-how, knowledge, technique, tradition, stories passed down by educational institutions from generation to generation, most part oral. However, what is important is here is to initiate an active reflection on the importance of evidence from the past, of the memory of design, for future of creativity and future of education. Indeed, Heritage is an immense workshop, offering a different vantage point and the current and the dynamic perpetration <coughs> for cultural and creative industries, where memory can intersect. Future. Furthermore, today's designers and those of the future plane will play an essential role in safeguarding design and transmitting to the future generation. 
for a different observation and more actual interpretation. We need only, we need only think of a question of exhibition design or central role of communication design for this heritage. <clears throat> it is our hope that the world of education truly interacts not only with the real world of production, but, that, but also with the museum. It's important, really important relationship with the museum. And thank you to the International Museum of Ceramics because it's very important for Isia Faenza, the relationship with uh, Claudia and all the museum. The relation with the museum and vice versa. Also for the museum, it's very important the relationship with the, the university and the institution uh, of education. Design can and must also represent the greatest, the great challenge to communicate and give a new life of the diffuse heritage of the past and the, that our contemporary era. We must promote the layered wealth represented by our territory and our museum. So numerous, but often misunderstood, misunderstood forgotten, excluding the topical sites <coughs> of mass tourism. In Italy, the leaves and the vicissitudes of a museum are still far to be detached from those of country universities. The Ministry of Cultural Heritage, MIC or MIPACT, and the Ministry of University should increase their collaboration in the future to ensure that Italy promotes and benefits from its DNA, its immense heritage, providing more support to cultural and creative industry. In conclusion, <coughs> we must work to ensure that the self-governing and the promotion of, of our vast material and material heritage of architecture, craftsmanship, contemporary art and design involves the education of more informed the future generation with a greater critical spirit that permits design for innovation. We must return to think about cultural and creative production as a large ecosystem, a workshop and a point of exchange with the visual and performing arts. My invitation to reflect in order to return to consider our cultural and creative production not only as a possible lever of economic development, development, but also as a material and immaterial heritage, an extraordinary driver of social and cultural change intent on creating overlaps, research, experimentation, creativity, and dialogue for a new world, a new humanism, and the future marked by a more human scale. This is our ch challenge. This is the challenge for education in design. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna, for uh, your uh, inspiring uh, lesson. I strongly believe in the connection between uh, museum formation and education, and uh, we can uh, testify this uh, important uh, collaboration with uh, ISEA, ISEA, which is a partner inside the CERTI project. I really appreciate that you point out uh, uh, the fact that we have to rebuild a conscience and uh, the fact that we have uh, to contaminate uh, uh, different fields, uh, no boundaries. This is very important in this very moment. Uh, of the idea of what we would like to have as a design and as a designer. And uh, uh, you focus uh, uh, the fact that the, the designer is uh, uh, a person who uh, is uh, uh, facing the needs of contemporaneity and um, he is in connection with the local activities, uh, the genius logi, and uh, the skill of the ends is something that it is extremely important in this very moment and there is uh, this return to the skills of the end and we see in all the arts and uh, especially in design and uh, as uh, you will uh, um, imagine from uh, the, the presentation of uh, Giovanna, Giovanna is a very passionate in education <laughs> 
and uh, we uh, we have to thank her for uh, uh, many efforts he is uh, making for uh, uh, towards the Ministry of uh, Italian Education and uh, especially we have to thank her for uh, the vision of uh, uh, ISEA and the University of Design uh, building uh, a project with this uh, PH, PhD in design yeah. which is very very important and uh, she point out the fact that there is this lackness in Italy in, uh, in this field and um, it is very important, uh, not just for uh, Italy, but uh, uh, it is important to rethink uh, the, the way of uh, the formation, the education in the field of design in, in Italy. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Giovanna, for your uh, um, intervention. And uh, yes, we, um, we have uh, uh, in the chat a comment from uh, Stefania Pandozzi that uh, we, we know from uh, the Vatican Museum that uh, uh, she said it's fundamental for the dissemination of knowledge and creative experiences for the education of designers in this difficult time and for the future of new generation, truly a great and excellent award. So many compliments to you, Thank to Izia. And uh, to the connection that you create uh, with other university of design in Europe, and uh, this is uh, uh, very important uh, to to growth. So um, let's uh, uh, pass uh, the the voice to um, to uh, Forma Fantasma, Forma Santa Fantasma, and I really thank them for uh, being here with us. We planned uh, this, uh, this meeting uh, a long time ago, uh, and uh, here we have Simone Faresin. Um, Forma Fantasma is a studio based in Amsterdam, as we know, uh, and it, it, it was founded in 2009 by Andrea Trimarchi and Simone Faresin. And uh, they have uh, defended the ethical values and holistic thinking of design. Their aim is to facilitate a deeper understanding of the environments we live in and propose transformative intervention to design. Simone, the place, the word is uh, to you and uh, thanks a lot for uh, your being with us. Mute me. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, it's a pleasure to finally be here. So um, today I'm going to share a, a presentation um, where I uh, decided together with Andrea to actually focus on essentially two works um, that are present the way uh, our studio is developing in this specific moment. And that we think gives a clear perspective of our approach to materials in this moment uh, in time. So let me just share the presentation. Hold on for a second. Uh, uh, I can say that if there are any questions, put the comments on the chat that I will forward to Simone uh, just after his uh, presentation. And uh, of course, uh, this, uh, um, this conference will stay online on our YouTube channel, Mick Fanta YouTube channel. And uh, if somebody didn't uh, have the opportunity to start from the very beginning, uh, they can always uh, uh, watch it later. Um, yeah. You have to share your screen. Yes. You want it? Uh, okay. Yes, I'm coming. No problem. Sorry. Uh... So do you see my screen now? Not yet. Sometimes it happens that we have a technical problem. Yeah, I don't understand uh, why. Um, I'm really sorry, but for some reason it's not sharing the screen. Um, it, it, it's uh, sometimes I it happens. To, um, 
Uh, I'm sorry, we, we did test this yesterday. Yes. Uh, if you don't mind, I log in again from another computer. Uh, okay, so uh, we don't waste time. Just give me time. one second. Uh, okay, okay. And, I'm logging uh, in again. Okay. Uh, so um, we we know from a very long time uh, uh, this uh, this studio, as I told you, uh, they are based in Amsterdam, and they make a very interesting research, and uh, they focused uh, on the, the idea of uh, a different design, not just for function, but it is more linked to what uh, uh, was uh, saying before uh, Giovanna in uh, her speech. Uh, so this uh, connection uh, uh, with uh, the genius logic, the connection uh, with different practices, uh, with different uh, reflections, uh, because we will see that uh, they uh, they pro uh, they don't have a production. They have uh, a very specific uh, poetic uh, way of thinking, design and uh, and uh, thinking and producing ceramic. And in this, uh, in this period, uh, just last week, if I'm not wrong, they opened um, an exhibition uh, at the Museum of Contemporary Art in, uh, in Prato, the Pech Museum. Uh, and uh, we will ask uh, something about this uh, to, to them if uh, they will be able uh, to, to log in. And uh, uh, as a... Uh, as I said, we spent a lot of time in organizing this conference and we were trying to have them as guests because they have a very an agenda full of appointments, international ones. Two years ago, I visited the Museum of Design in um, uh, in China, um, and uh, I saw uh, their works uh, together with the major um, pieces uh, of uh, designer, international designers, and uh, it was a kind of emotion because uh, it was uh, uh, very important to see pieces from a very young uh, studio, uh, and uh, I'm I was very. Um, proud that uh, these uh, two guys were in this beautiful design museum in uh, in china so simone let's try again <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> no no problem it, it happens so i just uh, i was just uh, trying to say something about you and uh, your activities but if you can try again to share your uh, presentation we were saying that uh, that you just opened an exhibition in uh, prato and uh, yeah, you will tell us about this. Do you, sh do you see my screen now? Yes, and uh, not. Do you see it? No. No? No. <laughs> yes, okay, now. Really... now. Oh, uh, okay. no. Okay, I, yeah, I don't of know. Of course, because I interrupted the presentation. Okay, so uh, okay. I'll do it again. Okay. No problem. Mm. We are perfectly on time, so no, no hurry and uh, no problems. Okay, I think you should okay. be able to see my screen now. Yes, we are. So Great. the words to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, me and Andrea, we are, you know, both uh, Italian designers, but we established our own uh, studio ten years ago in um, uh, in Holland after studying here at a master program uh, of Design Academy Eindhoven, where now we are also having a, um, a master called Geo Design, and um, in um, since the beginning of uh, you know our our practice. We uh, understood that we needed to establish it in in different ways. One that I would say it's a bit more commercial. So where we collaborate, um, you know, with the uh, producers and brands. So I would say with a more traditional approach to design. And one that is a bit more radical. It is a bit more research based. And the reason why 
we develop our practice in this way um, is because uh, not always you can achieve um, what you're interested in doing with the collaborators you um, the collaborations you establish and there is a component of our work that needs to be independent that needs to be more uh, research based because only through that kind of work we can we can question our own position as designer in the world we live in in this specific moment in time our studio is rather small um, and maximum we are in eight uh, in eight person and we want to keep it in in, in this way because uh, we are afraid that otherwise we would not be able to follow the works in the way we like, but also to engage with um, with uh, education as much as we are doing in this moment in, in uh, Eindhoven, uh, but also with developing of works that needs time. And today we decided to focus on essentially two works. One is called Aura Streams and the other one is called um, Cambio. And there are two works that explore materials. Um, uh, well, I don't think they only explore materials, but they explore the, the politics of how we use materials in the belief that as designers, uh, if we want to improve uh, the way we, um, we design things and, and for things, our ideas of things is very expansive. It can also be services, or other design outcomes, uh, we need to be more aware of uh, not only the needs of the users that we have in front of us, but also of what lays behind uh, production, extractions, distributions, and recycling of materials. Um, as I said before, me and Andrea, we're also in, engaging with education. Since September 2020, we have been asked by Joseph Grima, who is the Artistic Director of Design Academy Eindhoven, to lead the, the geodesign department, which is uh, focusing exactly on some of the issues we will explore today through two of the works we are presenting, um, and that has a uh, ecological concern, uh, and is trying to, I think, investigate with the help of students um, different ways that designers can operate in today's um, climate crisis. So the first work that I'm introducing you is uh, called Aura Streams, and it has been commissioned by a museum in Australia first, the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne, and in the second phase by uh, the Triennale in Milan, thanks to Paolo Antonelli, the curator of the Broken Nature exhibition that many of you probably have seen a few years ago. But to go back to the commission, so the National Gallery of Victoria is a museum that only recently started to uh, collect also design in their collection. And so they came with a very specific commission, uh, even if also at the same time quite broad. They, uh, the curators were engaging with our um, um, research-based approach, uh, but at the same time, uh, they had a need. And so this need was that whatever we were engaging with, the outcome was supposed to be finalized in a series of furniture pieces because uh, the collection of the museum is based on furniture. Uh, and this, in a way, it is um, uh, an interesting but also challenging request because in, on one side it is about asking designers to engage with research, but at the same time also asking them to finalize their research into, uh, into objects. And, uh, you know, uh, we will see today how we somehow manage to sort out these two very different requests. But let's go back for a second to Australia. So, um, you know, for a very long time, actually since the beginning that we started our own uh, uh, career, we uh, very often focus on materials. Um, but with our streams and later with Cambio, which is the second project we will introduce today, I think our approach became a bit more programmatic, a bit more, um, I would say, clear. Um, and uh, we knew when we um, approached this commission that we wanted to do a body of work that was reflecting on the ecological and political implications of extracting materials. And um, Australia is uh, one of the few um, uh, Western, if we can call Australia Western world countries that is uh, still extracting uh, many mir minerals from the underground. Their economy is st still very much affected by by this, and uh, and so at the beginning of the project, we started looking really into the extraction of minerals. But 
at one point in the process of research, we decided to, let's say, move away to uh, from Australia and to focus on a subject which is a bit more specific, which is uh, the um, uh, the recuperations of metals from electronic waste. Um, why did we did uh, we decided to to shift to focus the project in in this way? It's because we realized that the there is a clear uh, you know, interest in recycling, fortunately, and by most probably by the end of the century, the majority of metals we will use for production uh, will come from recycled sources. So not anymore mined from the underground of the planet, but from above ground. We could call that uh, above ground mining or urban mining, but it's basically the recuperations of metals from already used uh, materials such as components for architecture or, or products. And of course, recycling is extremely uh, important and vital, but there are still challenges, um, even uh, when recycling products. And uh, one of the most challenging um, areas of products to recycle in this moment is electronic waste. Um, and uh, we decided to focus on electronic waste uh, because in a way all our work is mediated by electronic products, but also because in this moment, electronic waste is becoming the fastest growing stream of waste, which does not mean that it's the biggest, but it's the one that is growing the most. Of course, we have to think that uh, if we want to define what electronic waste is, is everything that has either a battery or an, elect or an, an electric cable, and I would say an electronic chip, and we you know, of course, we know that with the Internet of Things, then, um, you know, basically everything, almost everything is becoming electronic waste. Um, but um, the main struggle with recycling electronic waste is that electronic products are often very complex to be recycled. And I guess we all know that for a very long time, uh, many of these products were exported in uh, Ghana or China, to just name the, the most known cases. But um, this, in these days, things are changing. For instance, China is now not importing any more electronic waste. It's refusing to do so. And then there is, of course, a cascade effect. And electronic waste is uh, often now exported illegally to other, to other countries, such as uh, India. The, the problem here is that until the 90s, there was not really any regulation regarding this. And, the um, Europe and the US were really guilty of exporting many, many electronic products that were often dumped open air. Uh, and the reason was that there was somehow an interest from importing countries of electronic waste because uh, within circuit boards there are precious metals, but uh, also because uh, they were very difficult to be recycled and it was much easier to just dump them uh, open air somewhere else. What we find uh, somehow interesting or revealing of this process is that first when we think about Ghana or even if it is a huge large continent the African continent uh, you know often rare earths and precious metals are extracted from those countries to produce electronics and somehow then those same electronics come back at waste and dump, dumped um, there instead of taking responsibility for for this so um, before to continue, I think it is also important to mention that, it, it, you know, when we got to this point, so we we started, you know, from the context in Australia, and then we focused on electronic waste. Mm -hmm. We realized that it, here there was clearly a, a very obvious design problem, because if things are uh, struggled to be recycled, it's because they were too complex in the way they were designed uh, for recycling. And I think uh, I also want to break the idea that you know, the, there is part of the world that is responsible in a way of recycling uh, electronics and a part of the world that is irresponsible. Uh, the situation is much more complex. For instance, in um, what we often call uh, developing countries, which is a word that I hate and I prefer to call maybe the southern regions of the world, um, uh, uh, they tend to recycle uh, not materials by components. What do I mean with this? So when an electronic product is discarded in Europe, for instance, and it's discarded correctly, first of all, it is ending up in a recycling center where uh, the 
once the ha hazardous components are removed, the product is shredded. And then all the different pieces of materials are divided by materials, so to obtain new materials from the recycling of these uh, shredded com leader components. Uh, um, in, uh, in other parts of the world, instead, uh, components are recycled. So the electronic product is disassembled and components are reused to produce new new objects. There's two very different uh, attitudes. So uh, we definitely uh, clearly in, you know, uh, for us, uh, individualize a, um, a, a design problem, which is how products are, electronic products are designed. But we still had to somehow structure our research more clearly. And we did so by looking into formal recycling. And for formal recycling, we looked into how products are essentially recycled in responsible facilities. The struggle instead that um, informal recyclers face, so recyclers that are maybe established in other than European or Western countries, and they have less available technologies, and often they are untrained um, in recycling. And then we looked in legislation and governance, and we looked, of course, also to get in contact with uh, producers of electronics products. Um, the investigation uh, took um, almost say, one year and a half, if not more, actually more than one year and a half, almost two years. And it was really about, um, not really about an interesting sense, which is about you know sitting down at a table and designing a product, but more dissecting how products are designed and dissecting how products are recycled, the facilities that recycle this and so on. These are you know, the spreadsheets that we compiled in reaching out people that could help us in learning more about this subject. So generally when we do this kind of research, we focus on, uh, first of all, in printed materials and documents. Often um, uh, we focus on legislation. So to understand the politics that govern uh, a subject. And, uh, and secondly, we establish um, a network of um, expertise that are willing and kindly uh, willing to share with us their, their knowledge and their time uh, because they um, think that what we're doing is somehow uh, relevant. And um, from I mentioned before that we also try to reach out with producers of electronics. It was extremely difficult to do so. And the, uh, one of the few companies that responded to us was uh, Fuji Xerox in Bangkok. Uh, well, Fuji Xerox is not a, it's a Japanese company. But we went to their uh, um, facilities in Bangkok. They were so kind to invite us there to understand more how they operate. And I think their business is extremely interesting because, again, I go back to what I mentioned before. What they say is they apply the best of the two worlds approach. So the technology is in, let's say, in... Um, in Europe and in Japan, and then they apply and they use the the to establish responsible recycling facilities in developing countries where manual labor is less costly, to uh, responsibly um, dismantle their products and recuperate uh, components. Um, but as, as I said before, we needed to get in touch also with recyclers and we individualize three major areas. So recyclers that deal with small electronic appliances, uh, recyclers that deal with cooling devices, and recyclers that deals with electronic products, such as computers, tablets, and so on. Uh, of course, some of these companies take care of all these areas, but it was good to map out the struggles that these recyclers face when having to uh, recycle products. And of course, whenever you talk with companies like this, the first reaction is we don't have any problem because we are extremely efficient. Uh, it is fantastic to recycle and so on. Of course, they are very proud of their businesses and what they do. Uh, but then when you engage more in a conversation, you understand they are facing problems and there is a lack of clear um, governance also of how products are designed to help and facilitate recycling. And then, of course, we did not want to focus only on the problems that Western countries are facing. So we tried to reach out to um, NGOs that could help us understand uh, really the, the the troubles they are facing in establishing responsible facilities, for instance, in India, in Bangkok, and in uh, um, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Burundi, and Congo, uh, through the help of um, NGOs that are dealing with, with these uh, issues. 
And last but not least, we thought it was extremely important also to, as I mentioned before, to understand how the, which are the politics that, get, that really are creating governance for these problems. And so we got in contact with the United Nations University, or at least a scholar of the United Nations University, Interpol, which is international police and take care also about environmental crime, and the European Electronic Recycler Association that are lobbying for the, the needs of recyclers. The, uh, uh, you know, when we engage with, a, with such an expansive investigation, for us, the outcome is not only about the objects we did for the museum or the, the outcomes and videos that I will show you later, but also, in fact, all this content that we have been gathering. And so we, um, with the support of TNL in Milan, we put together this website, which is called orastreams.com, where we compile the uh, selections of the interviews that we conducted um, on the subject and a um, an archive of with the selections of papers that we felt were uh, interesting or, or books to um, um, you know to investigate or to read in case somebody is interested in this in this subject. So for us, this is a way of sharing the research we do and to make it available for others to possibly appropriate it and design over it. As I said before, sometimes it is uh, difficult to um, to um, engage with. Uh, practitioners that have a very different, uh, you know, role and mindset than the one we have. And so we had also to develop um, conversation tools. So for instance, this is a, a, um, a <sighs> screenshot of a, um, of a film where we have been disassembling uh, electronic uh, products. And um, in the studio, we did some very various typologies. And we use some of these screenshots to uh, go to the recyclers and talk about more, much more in details about the different components, different materials they find themselves recycling. Um, and the outcome of this investigation became a series of uh, videos and a series of objects. Uh, some videos, for instance, this is a frame of one where we use a discarded electronics uh, or actually old phones uh, to um, visualize in a very uh, clear way the main uh, technologies and the main processes that electronic products goes through in the moment they end up in a recycling facilities. So to, you know, it's almost basically an infographic. Uh, we also did a movie where it's much more looking at a problem from an historical perspective. This film, for instance, was more looking into the history of plant obsolescence, which is this uh, strategy to bust economy based on um, the, the designing of obsolescence, so creating a little glitch or problems either on a digital level or on the hardware of objects to make sure that users are forced to buy a new one. This it was a strategy invented uh, or at least named and theorized by um, a Bernard London who was um, uh, writing a paper addressing obsolescence as a solution for the economic crisis of the 29 in, in the United States and uh, the first product that was um, designed with obsolescence was um, the old-fashioned uh, bulb <coughs> where the majority of producers of the world uh, meet up to decide how long a bulb should last. Of course, this is a, a design perversion and we wanted to somehow address with this film. And last but not least, I think the most important outcome is an animation more or less lasting 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, where we list a, a series of very pragmatic strategies that we think we could apply nowadays to render products much more repairable and recyclable. And I will list a few uh, examples of these uh, strategies that came as the conclusion of this conversation with other different practitioners we've been engaging with. So some of these, of course, is extremely banal, and it's their banality that makes them even more relevant, I would say. Um, for instance, one of the biggest struggles when recycling uh, electronics is that if you want to, uh, to um, uh, reuse uh, components. Of course, you cannot do that if components are glued together or uh, if producers use very specific screwing systems that uh, are designed on purpose to do not allow users to repair their products 
or to recycle them uh, uh, comfortably. So we are advocating, for instance, for the use of a uniform universal uh, screwing system, so that also in countries where less tools are available, there, there should not be problems in opening up or recycling a, a product. You have to think that the quickness of recycling is extremely important to uh, lower the cost of uh, recycling. Um, batteries are the uh, the biggest problem in the in this moment when recycling because they must be removed if you want to shred a product for recuperating materials and so uh, accessing easily and quickly a phone is a, a, a solution so for instance an iPhone is definitely much more complex to uh, recycle to extract the battery compared for instance to an old-fashioned Nokia that it was extremely quick and easy to open from the back and extract the battery also, uh, electronic cables are often in black rubber, but uh, visual detectors that are used to recognize shredded materials struggles to recognize black rubber because it's very opaque, it doesn't reflect light. And so sometimes uh, small particles of uh, electric cables containing coppers ends up in the wrong stream of waste and they are not recycled. Again, mixing materials is, is very damaging the recycling process. So for instance, mixing metal and concrete in washing machine is a problem because then um, magnets that are recognizing, they are dividing materials to, for recycling, recognize concrete as a metal and contaminates that stream of waste. Um, uh, also, there's other very banal examples that I can make. Uh, in this moment, when uh, you find yourself opening up an electronic product, you don't know what is is hazardous. There are small components, for instance, in TV screens and computers that are dangerous to be touched by hand, but there's no a color coding, there's no labeling that highlight what is dangerous to touch by hand. And we are advocating for, for either universal color coding or a very clear labeling system so that also when electronic products are opened up and not by professionals, they can still be repaired by somebody without you know, uh, putting yourself in danger or also by untrained labor, they at least can recognize what is dangerous in the products they are recycling. Uh, we are also advocating for a, a material passport, a digital material passport. Um, you have to know that recyclers really struggle to uh, know what they're actually recycling in terms of plastics because they are engineered on a daily basis. So recyclers in Europe, for instance, the most sophisticated one, have a lab internal to their company because they need to analyze the plastics to know what they're actually recycling. And in developing countries, uh, again, I use this dreadful word, the, um, the uh, uh, plastics are often uh, burned to just see from the color of the flames uh, what kind of plastics they are recycling. But that, of course, is extremely dangerous for the laborer and the environment. These are just some of the strategies we uh, we uh, piled together in this in this document or in this uh, animation, and we think it just shows an attempt to um, it is an attempt to show how design can be applied for designing of products, but also for uh, uh, possibly even create governance in a more detailed level than what well, in this moment the European Union is doing, which is already in any case doing quite a great job. For instance, in finding companies that are or in pushing for finding companies that are using, for instance, plant obsolescence. A company, the installation in uh, during the presentation in Broken Nature, there was also a film, which was much more, I would say, looking at this problem from a much more realistic perspective. Um, we developed a film where we, we looked at the historical complex relationship there is between humans and extractions of minerals starting from when minerals, some of minerals ended up in the surface of the planet, such as, for instance, gold, uh, from rains of meteorites. We always find refreshing to have different um, scales of observations of a problem, one which is much more detailed and focused and one that is much more comprehensive, so that you can understand much more dynamics and patterns that are otherwise invisible. And I think design really needs to develop this much more holistic perspective. It's not only focusing on the needs of users. I think for a very long time, we focus too much on the desires and needs of users, while there's plenty of needs of other creatures on the planet of, uh, and, um, that we, for instance, have never really focused upon. But 
Uh, as we, I mentioned in the beginning, the installation or the work was also finalized as a series of uh, objects that were presented um, in the uh, in the museum, where we use, of course, uh, my jump to the object, uh, recycled materials. But the objects for us in this case are not really meant to serve as a um, as a solution, but they are actually the object that allowed us to, for, to do the research. So we don't see the object as a solution, but as a tool for research. They are uh, what allow us to get in contact with recyclers of circuit boards, with recyclers of aluminum, with um, uh, to understand where, for instance, um, that stocks of very functioning products are stored, and if they are re-entering the market or not. And they have this role of, of course, being objects in themselves, but they also work as Trojan horse for our research process. And they respond to the request, of course, of the museum. I think I already spoke for quite some uh, some time, but I would like to at least speak about uh, Cambio, which is the um, uh, exhibition that we did at Serpent and Galleries last year, and now is at the Pitch Museum in, uh, in Prato. Um, which is instead shifting the attention from electronic waste uh, to a completely different area, which is the governance of the timber industry. We decided to, to change our attention to this industry because we felt that we, we struggled after oil streams to get in touch with the electronic producers to somehow apply what uh, our investigation sort of put on, the, on display. And we thought that going back to, to timber would have allowed us to... Um, have the possibility to linking with um, producers uh, of, for instance, furniture that are, you know, uh, an area of design that is more probably open for our for our questions and our suggestions. And the wall exhibition is basically essentially focusing on the governance of the timber industry. So it is not an exhibition about wood. Uh, it is not an exhibition about wood and its possibilities and material, which I think is what often designers focus on. It's really about what you can do with the material. Instead, we are looking more at, at the politics that shapes this industry to possibly gain knowledge uh, and reapply this knowledge in the moment we work with producers that actually use this material. And of course, the, the wall exhibition had an ecological concern and it was really exploring subjects such as, for instance, the relationship between production of, of objects and the intake of CO2 uh, of, of trees. Um, uh, and so how trees are, of course, providing materials, but they're also providing services in, for climate mitigation. And the World Exhibition was a continuous conversation with a variety of different practitioners from scientists, institutions such as the Kew Gardens in London, the Victor and Albert Museum, the Tuning Institute in, in um, in Germany, which is focusing on uh, uh, making forensic analysis on uh, material samples that enters the European Union to make sure that uh, the materials that enter the EU are coming from uh, legal sources of wood, but still uh, there's a lot of troubles in you know guaranteeing the materials are safe. Still 30% of materials uh, based on wood entering the European Union are coming from illegal sources. Um, and uh, we um, also uh, worked with activists that also consult the European Union in developing films and documentaries to really understand uh, how this industry that we uh, end up supporting as designers nowadays is, is shaped and how this politics can somehow influence us as designers. These are some pictures of the film on display. Um, but the, one another reason why we decided to focus on, on timber, it's because it's something we could not explore, and I hinted to it before with Aura Streams, is that uh, there are also ethical questions that emerge when, as designers, we work with living creatures. And of course, trees are living creatures. And um, we are trying to question this in, in the exhibition, also thanks to the contribution of Emanuele Cocha, the philosopher, with whom we develop a film where, sorry, I'm jumping to the film, where we are, uh, basically we use a scan of a forest um, uh, with a technology called LiDAR, which is often used to um, produce 3D reconstructions of forests so that uh, um, producers or, or companies that, that cut wood can do selective logging and chose which trees to extract from the forest. 
And we use this this um, technology instead to literally animate the forest in uh, in, in the literal sense of um, making uh, to use film as an anim animistic tool and to uh, animate the the forest. And uh, Emanuele Cocha wrote a a voiceover for for us where trees are somehow speaking back to humans or or a forest speaking back to humans, questioning really the relationship that we have as humans with. Uh, with uh, with timber, so the, the 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 exhibition even here changes in um, in scale of observation from very close looking at the anatomy of wood till a much more metaphysical perspective with the contribution of uh, Emanuele Emanuele Coccia. The exhibition in this moment is on show at the Pecci Museum uh, in uh, in Prato, and it is also. Again, not only an exhibition, but it is also a website, sim very similar to the one of our streams, where we share the investigations that we did so far. And a, um, a, an Instagram um, live talk that we uh, did while the exhibition at Serpentine was closed with COVID-19. And uh, of course, also a, uh, a catalog where we, um, uh, we uh, somehow um, Actually, it's not really a catalog, it's a book where we are uh, exploring deep, more deeply some of the issues we are dealing with uh, in, the, um, uh, in the exhibition. Um, thank you for uh, listening to me, and I'm sorry I had to, to rush in for being late before because of the technical issues. Uh, thank you, Simone, for your presentation and for sharing your project and experiences uh, with us. And I think that uh, uh, what was important in your presentation, what is important uh, is uh, to underline the awareness uh, of uh, the use of the materials, uh, uh, the ecological uh, concern uh, and uh, especially the engagement. Uh, the way the designer is uh, working as is a political action. Uh, but it, it is a uh, in every action we made, even if we are not designer, is always a kind of a political way of understanding and of behaving. And uh, your, uh, uh, your presentation uh, shows this uh, green way of behaving, as uh, at the beginning Jacques uh, uh, underlined, uh, which is uh, an important part of the work of uh, the makers in general, not just the designer, the artist, the intellectual part. And uh, what is important uh, is uh, the idea of responsibility in design, mm -hmm. uh, which is today more and more important uh, with uh, all the problematical uh, part that we are facing each day uh, for uh, preserving uh, our planet and um, I think that uh, uh, what you suggested it is that we need a change of approach uh, a different scale of uh, observation uh, which leads uh, to uh, the idea of this holistic uh, vision of uh, the designer that uh, Giovanna uh, was underlining in her speech so uh, thank you very much for uh, your uh, um, sharing with us your ideas your project and uh, um, it is thank not you. just uh, a, a principle that uh, it is uh, uh, strictly connected with uh, the work of the designer but it is a, a principle for everybody so um, i have a question because uh, uh, you didn't uh, uh, put any slide on the, your ceramic production, and uh, which is uh, just uh, very simply, which is your uh, uh, experience and uh, uh, relationship with the ceramic. Yes, no, I, I, I removed it because I realized I would have never managed to speak about uh, all the work. I can imagine, yeah. Um, but uh, no, indeed, I, it was interesting to include that work because it was actually um, the first experience we had, well, not the first, but the most consistent experience we had with, with ceramic was actually with our graduation work when we were still basically students already in 2009, so quite some time ago. 
Um, but again, there, for instance, what we um, what we tried to do with that work was not to look only at ceramic in terms of what you can do with it, but also the historical connotations that uh, the material takes with it. In specific, we were focusing on uh, the ceramic tradition in Sicily, in Caltagirone, and we're looking at the um, uh, a specific piece, which is called Teste di Moro. Many times knows it's basically a vase with a face with the features of a um, an African person. Uh, in these days, it would the result is extremely insulting. I think it is an insulting piece uh, because it, it it's basically a, a black face uh, portrait. But the origin of the work is much more complex than that. Um, and we looked into it and its historical references and. As you, many of you probably know, um, Maiolica was imported in Italy, and not only in Italy, but in the southern region of Mediterranean countries, um, thanks to the African-Arab invasion during medieval time, that imported these techniques of developing uh, uh, ceramic. And, uh, and so we thought it was somehow interesting that um, back then we were already facing a, a um, refugee crisis. And we started to see the link between um, uh, craft and how craft is appropriated. Craft, let me use this word, which is very complex, but let's say ceramic or, or some craft works are often appropriated by nationalist politics and they are held up as a, um, a representative of a local culture. But uh, in the specific tradition of Maiolica, in Sicily, it is evident how this local culture is fruit of migration flows. And we were somehow linking the the, the original um, you know development of ceramic in Europe uh, to the contemporary issues of the refugee crisis and how the the sometimes the struggles of a craftsmanship to evolve is also connected to this idea of conservation of culture which is not something we want to support. So it was a work which was actually extremely critical with um, the cliches of, of craftsmanship, which is not something that actually is really explored in in, uh, in Faenza, because I know their, their reality is completely different and definitely not rooted only in tradition, but also in innovation. Um, and so uh, for us, it was again a way to look into materials, not from their technical possibilities, but from their cultural connotations, and which is often what we are interested in doing with design, because design is a discipline that sits in the middle of many different aspects, economy, sociology, anthropology, um, cultural development, and that's what we are interested in design. So thank you, thank you very much, Simone, for this, uh, answering this question, but uh, we can say that uh, for your work, uh, there is also an engagement, and uh, we can talk about engaged ceramic also in this, uh, in this project. So thank you very much, you. and uh, of course, uh, everybody can, uh, um, uh, can see uh, the works of Forma Fantasma from their website, and um, I will check if there are any uh, comments, uh, of course, always positive comments for uh, and the reaction uh, to uh, the speakers. And uh, now we pass uh, to another speaker, uh, Karak Design, uh, which is uh, an Austrian uh, design uh, studio, and uh, we have uh, Thomas Rosler together with us uh, this morning. Uh, Karak Design is a team of uh, designers, architects uh, and uh, artists who share a distinctive notion of beauty. They work in the area of conflict that exists between perfection and accident and believe that objects born of this tension are able to touch people on a rational and emotional level at the same time. Um, uh, it is a young tile manufactory that unites tradition and modern spirit in handmade clay products. Thomas, the, the, the word is to you. Thank you for sharing your experience and thank you for being with us as a speaker. Thank you for inviting me. So I will share the screen. Can you see the screen? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, the, 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 
Okay, now it's perfect. Can you put the presentation? Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting. So me and Sebastian Rauch, we have a small tiles manufactory in Austria. And since we are young, we are talking about many things, what we are doing and also why we are doing and also what's the outcome of what we are doing. We believe that how a thing appears is the result of the subtotal of every single step involved in its production. And how a product feel is more about the attitude, how it is produced. Uh, in this presentation, I called it the timeless way of making. I want to try to share our thoughts with you. Uh, we as humans, we make things for a long, long time. Uh, and the making and also the outcome involves a very deep and very old human emotion. Uh, in which every single step is very crucial. What makes value of things for us is very often a question we are asking. And for us, it's not uh, obvious what it is. But for us, it's uh, the inherent beauty of the thing itself. And we think every step is important. And one step is the place we are making the tiles. Uh, this is based in Austria. It's a 140 years old textile factory. In the Alps, you can see the mountains. And this factory is surrounded by uh, very functional uh, productions, which only purpose is effectivity. And this is also how they look like. And this 140 years old building is under monument protection. And we believe that no, no of these production halls surrounding it will ever get to this status. We always laugh about that the only beautiful thing on these production halls is the site on to our factory. Uh, like Massimo said, people need stories. And we believe that craft can can be one of these stories. And also we believe that uh, we hope actually that a home is not its pure function of four walls and a roof. A home has to be much more than its pure function. And valuable things feel, fulfill more than just the mere function of it. And it has very often a very deep meaning, which we need very much. And I want to tell you a story about that. When I was in China for two months, I met a guy. He learned me how to work bamboo. And there was the first time I understood craft also as a language, because he could not speak English and I could not speak Chinese. But I didn't laugh so much. Uh, as with him and in the ending he gave me a wooden bracelet and it was an ordinary wooden bracelet maybe its cost was five cents and he gave it to me and also showed me a picture when his father gave it to him when he was 13 years old and so this five cent wooden bracelet becomes a, a very high value to me because of its story and another thing is the makers. We want to believe that it's not tradition is not the worshiping of its ashes, it's to move on its fire. And so we make everything on our own. We no and a funny thing is that no one of us is a ceramist. We are very different craftsmen from wood and metal, also printing. And we believe that it's very important to make the things on our on our own and we don't think so much how the tiles should look like then we think about the thought behind the tile and it's very interesting for us that every hand and every thought influences the result massively of the ceramic tiles and it's not about the measurement you cannot 
measure this. It's more a spiritual thing. Maybe it's more a feeling of of this. And it starts with the material. We make the material on our own, or we mix it on our own in Schlinz together with Martin Rauch. He has a company. Uh, he builds rammed earth houses around the world, and it's a very nice thing. You have the material. We can mix our material on our own because the big companies cannot make it in the same quality we want to have them because their machines are so advanced that they cannot make this quality. And also, uh, we keep the whole value chain in our house, the quality management. Also, it gives one person a job. And the, the good thing about uh, making the own material is that you can control many of its different facets of the material. And this is a uh, loam from Westerwald from Germany. It's uh, an expensive one. And also the material is more than double as expensive than if we would buy it from bigger companies. But we believe also in the material, the inherited verse of making your own material also goes into the end result of the ceramic. We are not against technology. This is our press, and we press this earth in a form. Uh, the technologies can help us to multiply our strengths. So we cannot press this with the hand. So uh, we very much love our press to do our work with this. And a story for this one was I bought the press and said to the guy, it has to be slower than the person filling it so that the press has uh, the person has to wait for the press to end and not the other way around i know this from a lot of productions where you can be as fast as you want but the machine will always be faster than you so our press is slightly slower than the person and i believe this is a dehumanizing process which is happening where you put second and the machine is put first. So this also is a, a little step in the production, we believe, to be very important to look out for the step. And out of the press comes the brick. It's a, a raw brick, and we very much love the honesty in the material. It's uh, just pressed earth and we very often say that our innovation is to radically reduce the complexity of the production we think it's a very important thing in this time where no one can even understand anymore how things are made and what i understood when people came into our factory to watch what we are doing is that everyone has a piece of technology in his pants which he cannot even understand how it's working and it's not very interesting. But when they see how we put earth in a form and press it, they are overwhelmed about this uh, process. And for me, it's uh, kind of funny that people can understand this speed and they can see it and this craft, they can feel and understand what's happening. So it's much more interesting for them than their iPhone in their pockets. And the next thing is the hand. The hand is our master tool we use all the time for many different things. And for me, it's very often so interesting how which little nuances the hand can make and makes an impact on the ceramic tile. And after time, you can tell which one has retouched which ceramic tile and there is a concept it's not about right or wrong we cannot measure our ceramic tile it's more of an abstract it's more of an abstract thought of a concept of beauty because it's very very hard also for the people to explain what is good and what is not good if you normally in productions you say 
this is the tolerance if it's above or under it's not good but for us it's more the self-determined concept of beauty if the ceramic tile is good or not and we also believe that this is a this puts also a little bit of meaning to every person also what i understood in many productions i have been there is very often you cannot even do something wrong the the things are made that you as a person cannot even make a mistake also if you want to have it so and no one no one really would make the mistake but the knowledge that you could make the mistake makes the process a lot more humane than you are just there because there is not a machine yet made to replace you and i think the people appreciate very much this thought of being in control of their own work and also we have a stamp on the back and the stamp is still we hammer it in with a stamp it would be no problem to integrate it in our press form it would be very easy actually and also would not make any more cost to integrate it in the press but we if we remove all the steps we can also go on from there and say okay the the stamp we put in the press let's also put the retouching make uh make the press form better so we don't have to retouch it anymore and we will end in yeah why even make the ceramic tile let's put it to china or also there is the thought with the material let's buy it from the big companies it's more cheap and more available but this will destroy the whole attitude we have for our work uh, entirely and also this brings us to fired earth we very often see that ceramic as beautiful it is will very often hide its true properties uh, and want to appear as something else very often we see that they even are undistinctible from other materials like marble or wood or stone they want to imitate every every single material and this this will or we feel that this will bring us to a very superficial world if we make this much longer and yesterday sebastian we talked about and he said a very funny story he said that he was choking when he were was with his cousins playing computer games maybe 15 years ago he said they said in 15 years the surfaces will be much better they will look much more realistic in the computer games and now we can see that they look better in the computer games but the real world surfaces look more like the surfaces in the computer game so we think this is not a very nice uh uh evolution of things to go if you think that or if you believe that it's not a mere function that there is something there with no meaning at all just uh just a lie in front of you so we love this fire dirt it's just uh the pure material and you can see it, it's very raw and it has this very very nice feel to it in our opinion and from there we can go to the order uh me and sebastian we talk maybe since we are 15 years old uh, main topic always was how much order has there to be chaos uh, and so for the order we use a lot of technology we use the computers to generate all of our patterns we make all the patterns ourselves and marketing uh, so everything we do we make on our own but there is this order needed and with this order we make we try to make this tension between a very perfect geometrical pattern which is put on onto this raw material we are doing and this creates a tension of 
perfection and imperfection. And like uh, you read before, this we believe and we really feel this and see this with our clients. Uh, it really touches people on a uh, rationally and emotionally level. So the people can really feel that something more is in there than the mere product, uh, than the mere product itself. So I think this is very important in all of our productions to be seen that this tension uh, is there because we as humans are imperfect. And if you go into perfect rooms, it's almost like your soul has no place to be there. And I personally felt that when I put on a suit, I like put on a suit, but I stand, I my stand is different, I talk differently. And so there is much more to rooms. And if you think this is the room around you, so and it affects you. And if you are in a maybe in the company where we are working, which we designed also on our own, on our premise, it also influences everything around you. Like if you put on a suit and in the finance, finance business, they even call the suit an armor. And I really believe that's the case in many things. So we come to the attitude. And for us, it's a lot. It's all about the attitude behind of our work and this is an old blacksmith forge we are in the old blacksmith of this company and we reused it and we went to a very old gold manufacturer and bought gold to put to coat this old uh, forge with gold it took us maybe 23 hours and it was a very fun day. I never said the gold is going out so many times or bring me the gold. And this is like a statement for ourselves and for our work we do. Uh, we, saw, we saw that if you look how we make machines at the beginning, they were one of the first machines was made when we didn't even know how a machine should look like. It was made of the goddess Nike and it had a golden cylinder. And you can see that the people saw that there is much more to the work we are doing uh, than we do right now. We feel that today it's all about you only put money somewhere if it's more effective or faster or more safety then behind the things this is maybe people can say this is an irrational thought because it cannot make the tile better but in our understanding it's not measurable how it makes the ceramic tiles better or our work better but we clearly feel that it does make it better and also we don't believe in this obsession about innovation and this dogma we build upon it that new equals better. Uh, it, it just makes us the feeling that it uh, replaces a sense of timeless beauty with ever-changing trends. Uh, and very often also you can see that the new sustainable innovations are just old technologies in new clothes. So we know many things we know very, very long and still we are humans making things for humans. So I cannot really understand why we took away all the meaning and the beauty also in the uh, exhibition of Stefan Sagmeister, you could read that the word beauty almost is distinguished uh, out of the books we read. So it's even uh, an insult to tell someone things are beautiful and we cannot really understand how this comes about when we understand that we have this very very deep need for um, a bigger meaning than the pure function like the bracelet 
I told in the beginning of the, the story, these are the things with a true value for us. And I can imagine this story, everyone can understand what I mean. It's the, but it's hard to tell anyone. It's not measurable. So it's not so interesting for the industry, which have maybe a slogan like forum follows finance or something like that. Uh, this brings me to our tools. And also tools are the extension of our hand. Since we are human, we have tools. We always make tools and we use them since the beginning of time. And the funny thing is that we always decorate them. We always have decorated things we have since we can look upon them to make it our tools. And you can tell a lot of the tools people use, how they look like. And also, because we are so many craftsmen from different fields, we can make a lot of things on our own, like the press forms, our tools. And also from this one, you can get a feeling about the work ethic. It's more rough. The people are more rough. The job is more rough. And it's not a, a clinic where, or a laboratory where you work at. And this is all the tools are very often craftsmen, as I understood. They love tools and the technology behind tools. It's more about the attitude, how you use them than to use tools. In my opinion, it's more craftsmanship is for me, it's not uh, a special thing. It's an attitude against the uh, work and how you work. It's always this circle from head to stomach, to head, to stomach, to head, to hand, head to stomach, to hand, to stomach. And this in rotation will bring a lot about, and very often craftsmen have this mentality because they learned a lot of frustration tolerance. If you, it's the same with an instrument. If you want to learn guitar, you have to try and try and try and try a very long time. And you cannot do it, doesn't matter how much you want it. Uh, you need to want it to even do it, to understand, uh, to oversee this frustration you get time by time. But you can always have these incremental steps towards your self-picked goal. And I think in this lies a lot of meaning. It's not that we... It's a very different thing if you travel from Austria to China by bike or by plane. We think that things are normal, that you go into a plane and woke up on the other end of the world, just there. And if you take the uh, bicycle, it's more our human speed. And I think it's uh, healing our soul. And also craft can do this for people if they involve themselves in craft because it shows them their failure and their talent and a lot of deep things everyone has to understand for themselves. It's even maybe a meditative process in this field. And another thing which is very important for us by doing things, it's the honesty. honesty is still, in my opinion, one of the hardest cur currencies there is. And very often we are losing it in the production and the products we are selling. Uh, you have to imagine uh, any relationship without honesty. It cannot sustain itself. It's the, the baseline of every relationship. And is it to produce a product or to make work, we have to be honest in what we do to make something honest out of it. So uh, we are in a way fed up with all the lies everywhere you look at, you cannot trust uh, the meat which is packed in the supermarket, you buy meat or vegetables. It's even cheated there. We 
make milk in Austria, ship it to, or bring it to Italy to pasteurize, bring it back. Uh, cow only has to be two days, I think, in Austria to call it Austrian meat and many things like that. And it's also in the craft, you can see um, an advertisement of a car company. I will not name the name, but the video is like that comes uh, the car and one guy is sitting in a room and suing a, a seat. And we were like, what? I'm sure it does not look like that. And in this old building we are in, it's very funny that two big major companies came to make their advertisement movie in our productions so that they can show that the things are produced here, but actually they are produced in these efficient functional halls. And I, I think they should go and make their videos in their own production halls to show the people what is really there. Uh, because in a way we identify through our work in a in a big part, it's a big part of our existence. And if you cannot identify with what you are doing, you are living a, a big lie in many things. And if you if you don't accept that, you have to consume things because why shouldn't you lie otherwise all the time? than to buy stuff and make your um, your personality through the things you buy. Very often, uh, not so long ago, 40 years ago, it was a lot of your personality, what you are doing. Now it's more uh, selfie obsessed generation, which defines themselves about their shoes they are wearing. And so we try to make, uh, we don't want to play this game and we make our own small environment around uh, this company. It's probably it's a small bubble which we can make for our own, but it's still a, a beacon and we believe in, in what we are doing and so do seven people who work with us. So we are thinking that this works because the people buy our products and this is how we can live. This brings me to the chaos. And we are using a 700 years old technique called Raku firing. I think this uh, is a, a term for the ceramists here. And it follows the, and Raku means something like joy in Japan. And it's, it's the technique of wabi-sabi, the beauty of the imperfection and the nature. And we always say, if you see a flower, you don't have to make the flower more effective or look more beautiful. It's a natural beauty, which is not made by man. And we very much love the Raku technique in our company because it's also a symbol for our own life. Till here, we can make a lot of adjustments or the results, but then we give it to the fire and we have to let go of the control. And we believe this is the point of the whole life in our own lives. You cannot always control the things. And if you could, it would be an awful life if everything uh, it li that went to lie somewhere else than in the pure order. It's, uh, I'm sorry, sometimes I don't, I forget the English words for that. But if you are in, a, in love with someone, it's also the possibility then it can go away, which makes also this tension between can work and cannot work where you uh, feel as a human the most, then to know that, okay, you have this and nothing can happen at all, this is the date you will die, uh, is very, very boring life in our opinion. So this process very often symbolizes this state of fact for us because in this adventure you will only see how the 
ceramic tiles finally look when they went into water and wash away and cool down the fire. And it's always a new adventure for us because every single tile really looks very, very different from the other ones. And this also is uh, the whole company is an adventure which was not sought on the table. This is not a, a concept or a company you would write down on a scratch board. It's the most uncontrollable uh, technique in a very high cost environment. In Austria, we have maybe the third highest cost of labor in Europe and then print and in, not in an area where ceramic is very big and there are a lot of points which are there so this was this began as an art project because Sebastian's mother wanted to have ceramic tiles for her own house she built with her husband Martin Rauch in Schlinz and then this came about and we followed it more and more and since six years this has got a legit company and this is uh, a funny it's all about the adventure that you don't really know uh where it takes you to and we see the company also not really as it's it's not about the product we see the product as our vehicle which can bring us to very different spots I can talk to the museum with your the International Museum of Ceramics. It can take you there or to different people. Uh, you can use it to make the workspace how you want it to have the working conditions. It's all in this adventure what the ceramic tiles can, uh, the Karak tiles can give to us. And very often the good things come by come by luck. And so we are very grateful to got this product. And when we think about the destiny, we actually we don't know where the destiny will end, and we even don't want to know, but we know it's always moving, it's changing. Uh, people have their thoughts, we make our thoughts and we build up upon what's already there. We don't have to invent all the time new things. It's very often also uh, a very, very nice and fulfilling thing to just take what's there and build upon it and make it further. And I think this is also a picture where a client came with a strawberry or with a I I don't know the name of this and she brought this berry and she had said she want to have this color for the ceramic tile so we made some experiments and this was the outcome of this client's request and we hope we will have many destinies going on and this is a very nice quote from Nicholas Gomez. If we want something to endure, we strive for beauty, not efficiency. And I think there is a lot of truth in this particular quote, which we very much appreciate and like. And maybe I can show you some projects we made. This is this oven for the client with the berry. It's a hotel oven. This is the floor in, these were the very first tiles we made for the house of Sebastian's mother and father in Schlinz. This is another project. We made the facade with these three-dimensional tiles, which are hollow, a small kitchen, those are the projects we make the most in maybe two or three square meters of ceramic tiles. These are maybe 80% of our work. Sometimes we have bigger ones like this stove in, a, in the oldest house in Lech or a floor for a heater. And this is the floor and this is the oven 
behind the behind this floor and this is a kitchen in Luzern and uh, a bar in Zurich. So I hope this was understandable. I'm not a fluent speaker in English. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, I really appreciate your uh, presentation uh, and uh, thank you for your consideration. Um, I really like uh, your beginning that home is not just a place of living, uh, as uh, I can say, ceramic is not just an object. And um, through your tiles, uh, you show what is behind. Uh, it, is, it tells uh, the story of uh, different hands. And um, what you suggested and what also suggested Simone before you was uh, the appropriate use of technology, which is uh, important, of course, but it is not uh, uh, the only part of uh, the project and of the production. And um, I think that uh, um, it is um, important uh, today to show uh, the skill of uh, uh, the, the ants, as it was said also before by, by Giovanna in her, in her speech, uh, to point out the, the precious works of the ants. Um, that, that shows also the timeless beauty of ceramics, but also of the making. Um, I, what I, I, I also see that the, the timeless beauty of ceramics is also what Jacques said before. It's very often put that art is not essential or things like I said, if it's not functional, it has no right to be there. I think it's the complete opposite. This is uh, the things we have to fight for. This is maybe why we will do wars over these non-essential things, as many people put it. But I think um, also when I was in, there was a year of catastrophic uh, rain. And what I understood there when I was uh, helping to clean the houses, I was maybe in 15 houses and the people lost their whole uh, belongings and see but the only thing they were really sad about were the photos and the the rest were just things they can renew or buy new and also in the eye of a catastrophic thing or if you are if you understand you have to flee immediately what would you take it's uh, more this thought which makes you to the person or what you like than the the mere the mere function of this i don't know i think it's uh uh made from the advertisement or advertisers that there is not more to a thing than the thing itself and like the talkers before said also it, it's really you have to understand but what did he say Twelve thousand years bc since we are doing ceramic bricks yeah, yeah. i think this is uh an amazing thought if you think about that it's yeah heavy yes that's heavy heavy as uh, jacques said uh, ceramic is a heavy thought and uh, what i really appreciated uh, in, and it is a red uh, red line in all the all the speech that we listen uh, is uh, the honesty the, the, the idea of honesty sustainability and responsibility and uh, so thank you, Thomas, for uh, sharing uh, your ideas. Uh, we received uh, many compliments and many common, positive comments on your work. And uh, um, the, your choice of uh, uh, Raku for your ties is uh, a very brave choice. Uh, and uh, you make a, a kind of a difference in the producing of, uh, of tiles. And um, it, as uh, we can see, in your presentation, it is not just a tile, but each tile is a story. So thank you very much for uh, uh, giving us this uh, concept and this uh, idea of uh, precious uh, 
hands work and the precious skills that it is behind uh, ceramic. You're very so, welcome. <laughs> so thank you, thank you very much. And uh, we pass, uh, we pass uh, to the, the last uh, speaker, uh, Carolina Bednorz, a um, Polish uh, talented uh, uh, designer and a ceramist, uh, working now in uh, Modena uh, in Italy. Uh, she graduated uh, from the Academy of Art and Design in Wroclaw, in Poland, uh, and um, she studied under a scholarship program at uh, ISEA, uh, the University of Design in France, and uh, she collaborated uh, with the European porcelain manufacturer in Meissen. So, Carolina, uh, it's your place, and uh, you are the last speaker of today, and uh, it's up to you. Um, Carolina, you are mute. Unmute the microphone, please. Yeah, thank you. No, I mean, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to switch on to my presentation. I hope it's going to go well if I'm visible. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm visible. Sorry, because I don't hear it well. Um, is it, is it visible? Uh, yes, uh, yes, of course. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, thank you. I just wanted to be sure. So, I will present my little uh, talk about this very bold uh, topic uh, and title Successfully Creative Ceramic Products and the Marketing. And for the uh, beginning, I would really want to thank you for this invitation, for this uh, conference. I'm really honored to be talking behind so wonderful ideas and behind so many uh, amazing speakers, really, I'm really impressed. Um, as Claudia said, I'm um, Polish, I'm, uh, I'm a ceramic designer working currently in modern Italy. I collaborated with uh, Meissen and Salek, the porcelain factory, and my pieces were exhibited in many in, uh, European exhibitions around uh, many, in many countries. Um, I graduated in 2015 uh, from Academy of Art and Design in Wrocław, Poland, and my master's degree is a specialty of art and design in ceramics. And those two parts of art and design are really important to me. And um, thanks to art, I learned how to um, uh, traditional use of ceramics, how to um, use potter wheel, how to handle, how to appreciate the material the clay, the different types of clay, how to do glazes. And uh, at the same time, my curves were consisting a design uh, part, very strongly connected to a design thinking, product design, uh, mold making, prototyping. And those two parts of art and design are really currently strongly um, based to my business. Uh, next to them, I score my um, academic uh, education. I have continued to participate in many uh, other uh, internships and placements and uh, residences. Uh, I was having a pottery wheel um, internship in the Essen in Germany. I participated in um, ceramic trends in Sargadenos in Spain. Next to learning uh, during a scholarship in Zia in Faenza, I also participated in a couple of visit to the Bottega and actually working there and learning Maiolica. In 2015, I won a Felisama Lab Design Design it's, uh, for innovative style design. And not next, and all those exhibitions, all those um, experiences in different places, in different ceramic um, realities, led me to incorporate many view of how you run trucks. So next to the Vista Alegre and Meissen big porcelain factories, I also have experience in the small manufacturer, small um, small studios, and understand how this kind of activity of passion working with the ceramics you can combine with the business. So very shortly after I finished my master, I moved to Italy, first to Modena, uh, to Faenza, and then in 2016 to Modena. And they're looking and trying to adjust the new country, new town, new job as a graphic designer. I um, 
I applied for the competition that I found online. It was Future Life in Ceramics. Uh, later, I discovered it's a uh, part of the Ceramic and Dimension European program for supporting and developing new talent in ceramics. Um, I was invited to participate in conference in the semi-finals, let's say, in SISCAS in Finland. And my uh, achievements, my project, my approach to ceramics, and I was chosen later as uh, one of the six winners of that edition. The competition is still running, so if you are a uh, young person, please uh, apply because it's an amazing uh, opportunity. For me, it was not only an opportunity to participate in many beautiful exhibitions around Europe, to many projects and give me a lot of um, collaborations, but also gave me a strong um, belief that I can follow ceramic path, that I can focus on uh, building my career around ceramics and about ceramic making, ceramic designing, and make a living of it. And uh, it was really strong input, especially when I moved to a different country, that pushed me forward. Uh, anyone who works with ceramics know that um, you need a space. Uh, you need a table, you need a space for the kiln, you need a shelf, you need a space for the materials. Uh, so, and it's not really possible to do it in your two room flat rented, uh, in the in, in rented flat that you cannot really do this kind of thing there. So, I started looking for a space for a studio and, um, by I don't know, by luck, I guess, I found on Instagram a duo of two people who were doing ceramics in Modena. And I went to them to meet them, they were Federica and Laura, and I asked them, uh, I'm looking for a space, I'm looking for a studio where I can do ceramics. And they agreed to let me in. After a while, uh, we had to change a bit the mode of the studio that we uh, share, because one of the person left. And and uh, we decided with Laura to open a co-working. And that's how Studio Loom was born. Uh, we opened in October 2018. And uh, currently it's co manage also with Elisa Castani and Alicia Debbie. And this is a creative uh, space, a co-working that creative people can come in and rent a desk. And not only for uh, craft makers, or ceramic makers, or jewelry makers, wood makers, sewers, but also a PC worker. So anyone who looks for a bit more um, dynamic space for co-working, wants to have a bit more contact with the material, wants more contact with people, it's uh, most unwelcome. And you can come for a week, uh, for a day, for a week, or for a month. Next to renting a space uh, in our studio, we are doing events and uh, courses. Um, me, for example, I'm teaching ceramics. So here it is. I managed to find a space. I managed to settle myself in, and I could start making ceramics. Yeah, this is a really high moment in any uh, beginner um, life and career. Mainly, I started with the uh, casting porcelain, which is my below material. But from last year, I'm also using uh, more and more pottery wheel with somewhere. Okay, so I managed to make my products. I'm focusing on making home decor, tableware, and jewelry. And now the big question is, uh, what do I do with them? <laughs> How do I manage? How do I profit from my passion of making beautiful objects that are um, helping other people life? How do I profit from it that I can sustain myself and how I can um, uh, push myself forward and not lose um, passion for it? And uh, now I will focus on a couple of different ways to do it, and that I, uh, from my experience, based. Because let's say honest, when I moved to Modena, I didn't know anybody. I didn't have family. I didn't have friends. I didn't have my colleagues from the university. I didn't have friends from the high school. So really nobody knew about me there. And how can I promote my products and speak about them? First of all, and what is uh, like a common mm, sense uh, activity to open your showroom. Showroom can be even a really, really small uh, shelf 
put your products in your studio. Um, when you have it in your studio, it's really comfortable because when you are working um, from Monday to Friday on the times that you are in the studio, when somebody comes, you can sell. You are not putting any kind of investment into that, except for being in the studio and working. What is really great about it is that you can show your products how they are beautifully exhibit in the space. You can explain in your person how do they use, how is the passion behind it. You can invite clients and potential buyers or shop owners to visit you and talk in person. Um, if you sell there, it's very comfortable because you don't need to ship. The more challenging part is to um, is to pack quite quickly when a client waits for it. And we and we with time we understand that uh, our Spain is bringing people with this uh, how to say passaparola in Italian. So it's like passing a word about us and existing so that people coming because somebody told about our space. And the little advantage of it also is that since I don't need to carry things, anything in pack, I can sell my outlet pieces, so like a test or pieces that I can send online. Um, and people are normally really looking for those special price for this. The next part of you can participate and show your product is participate in fair to market. There are two types of fair to market. The fairs are more kind of wholesale experience when you are booking a booth in some um, show um, and during a more like um, important, more uh, economically also investment moment to gain a client that will buy from you wholesale. The other ones are when you can sell in person to the people who buy. So it's literally you putting yourself on the street. <laughs> and you can sell the product and uh, this way is really great to gain new clients because you put yourself in the lives of other people you are not, uh, leaving your studio and you're showing what you do how great your products are what you can do and what you can sell at the same time this kind of activity is really energy consuming if, uh, if you think about it that you need to prepare for it you need to pack the pieces you need to set up the book you need to Pack, stay there for hours or days in the same place and then pack it back and come back to the studio. It can be really a week of your energy and your work to do that. But it's really, really um, well, uh, maybe not immediately, but it's really well to know you by other people. And the other challenge is that is the weather. <clears throat> because you can prepare everything beautifully, but if the uh, avenue is in an uh, outside and it's raining, you just stand there miserably and thinking, please somebody come and help me and be interested because with the cold weather, people don't buy. The other part of it's more like traditional and those three, uh, and those three activities are is retail shops. So maybe you found a shop that you are interested Maybe by walking in some towns, you discover a place that mm, you look inside and think, oh, this is a product that could be nicely put next to mine. I could fit my things there. And maybe somebody doing the fair recognizes you and writes you. Maybe somebody on Instagram recognizes you and writes you because asking for your product from a shop owner. And in that part, you have to recognize the audience of that shop. And uh, recognizing the audience is really important to not lose your uh, time and your resources uh, because maybe the, the shop is not really in the place that you are interested in. Um, the biggest uh, challenge of this activity is that relationship with the owner. You are having a close in dialogue that can last um, many years if you are, if you are well prepared and the person that you are talking with. Also willing to find somebody who understands why you do what you do, how long you do it, how long it takes, how much the price is important for your product. And sometimes you meet people who are not really interested in helping you, but if you want to get a very cheap product and uh, put them in the shop, and it's a waste of your time and resources. And then 
the part that is that you don't need to talk with the client, you don't need to care about putting clients to your product because it's the shop owner who is doing that, is that you are putting a price drop. And it's a wholesale price that you can be as uh, a half of your normal price in the product. Now, I would like to talk about more modern way and more innovative way to uh, find a client. It's an uh, online platform. And I would really rec uh, recommend it to people who start selling uh, because this kind of uh, platforms already have rules, uh, regulations, and payment processes ready for you. So you just have to put your pictures, description of your products, and then maybe start paying a fee because it depends on the platform. Thanks to that, that you use those platforms, you can reach a bigger audience because um, the platform takes care about reaching to customers, investing in marketing. But at the same time, it can be a disadvantage. And Etsy, which is one of the most common and most famous uh, handmade uh, portals, maybe 10 years, 8 years ago, it was quite easy to find new clients and get sales through the platform itself. But at this moment, it's really saturated with creators, with products, and it doesn't really care to show you. So it's up to you to get the link to your shop to your clients. The other part that I later discovered is that the platforms can be also having a kind of clientele of wholesale uh, shops. So I apply for one of them, it's called Factory, and it's really nice because it's run by two shop owners of Etsy that decided after years that they want to look for a better solution and take hand in your in their hands and start uh, making a um, a portal that is more friendly for the um, handmade business. And, uh, well, it's really interesting uh, to participate in that. And the other part, so if you already have a platform uh, you're participating, maybe you don't want to follow the rules that are posted there, and you open your own website. But the question is, is it a website or an online shop? And the online shop is uh, something that I discover I changed myself last year. For many years, even on the start during the studies, I had my website with my um, kind of um, projects, my um, creator silhouette, uh, what kind of interested. It also was a part of the blog that I was running through. But last year, especially during the um, Corona lockdown. I decided to change my approach, to, to try and do something different, which is to open my online shop. What is the difference? In website, you show what you can do, what you do, and maybe you leave a contact that somebody will write you. Instead, in online shop, you have a possibility to buy from me directly. And um, so this is a part when people are not so decisive about what they want. So you just have to show what you have and then uh, show them how to do it in short, in short uh, What about online show? Uh, as I discovered talking to many uh, online specialists and marketing, uh, online marketing specialists, is that it's a regular cost. Um, it can be smaller, it can be bigger, it can be around 350 euros per year, which is a, quite a cost. Um, you can ask somebody to make it for you. I decided to do it myself with one of the uh, possibilities that exist. And in that moment when you decide to have online shop, you have to decide about your branding. So invest time in developing a logo, investing time in colors, fonts, put a huge uh, pressure on good photography and description. And then invest time to find a way to show customers' uh, experiences, so customer reviews. Um, it's, it's a tremendous amount of time to do this. Uh, sometimes I really realize I'm spending at least one day a week just to focus on the online shop, to update new products to shop, to show what I do, improve their user experiences, work with the CEO. 
and um, it takes a lot of time, so uh, it's really time consuming. I lately uh, discovered also, I saw that some of the handmade business uh, creators are changing a bit the experience of online shop with the product always present um, to a bit more um, handmade friendly way, which I say about update shops. So you set a date on the shop and every two weeks, two months, you say, okay, I have new products coming up, get ready. This is what I do it at this time. And after that, I will have another time to set it up again. So it's uh, really more comfortable for the, for the handmade, for the ceramics especially, because we work with the kiln and the kiln you cannot open and or do a fine for one piece. So uh, it's more friendly for that. Okay, the next one is social media, which is probably as everyone would expect when I speak about it. And yes, it's a great tool to have more um, followers, more uh, people recognizing who your craft, your, um, your passion behind it. Um, and mainly I'm talking about Instagram, Facebook, maybe I know somebody who works on TikTok. Um, as uh, using this platform. Um, what do you have to invest in it? Mainly it's about good photos and effects. Um, I know people think it's only about pictures, but actually it's the text that brings you people back to you. It's how you describe what you do, how did you came to ideas, how do you um, interact with people, because this is social, so also you have to understand that this is for connect with others. It's not only your showcase or your um, uh, showroom of your pieces. It's actually about the interaction with uh, other people and other users. And this can be also having a downfall because people, some people don't understand that maybe writing you on Sunday at 10 in the evening is not really a time. You don't understand that you are behind that um, profile. And uh, what is a bit more tricky about it is that it's really a short life span of your content. So you have to always feed it. Feed it, feed it, actually within feed, because you need to feed it every day with the stories behind what you do, with the um, products you are promoting, products you are making, difficulties you are facing. And uh, it really can take a lot of time, it can take a lot of energy, and uh, it can be um, a time depressing to participate in that. Uh, we like to say in, in our studio that this is a kind of different job that you have to take and that you have to learn. And luckily there are many uh, influencers or um, kind of mentors who can show you how to use this platform better and more efficiently. Uh, the next one is the newsletter, which is my favorite one. Uh, why? Because newsletters, when you have your email list with people who sign up, who decided that, yes, I'm interested in what you're doing. I want to learn more. Tell me more. Send me more information. Uh, I would love to know more. And it's really refreshing because except uh, against those social media that you are writing to the gray mass of potential people interested in your thing, you already have people who said, yes, see, I want to know. And this is quite liberating because you are not feeling like disturbing anymore. You can share really more kind of personal approach to your product. You have more time, more space. You have more possibility to set your newsletter as you want. And this uh, results in the building a lot of lasting trust of the clients, of your, of your, um, uh, of your people who sign up for your newsletter. And it's really independent because as Instagram, Facebook, Etsy are being a platform of somebody else, even, even having your website sometimes can crash. Newsletters are really independent and nobody will take it from you. So if you have a contact with people, your emails, you can always write them and change maybe the platform that you're using for emailing 
uh, and you can uh, continue this for a very long time. And that's why it's one of my favorite ways to connect. The last one is media outreach. And this is the part when you um, contact uh, editors, magazines, bloggers, YouTubers, social uh, influencers to talk about your products. And can be really scary to start because it gets a risk of rejection and uh, naturally you don't want to be rejected. So it takes a bit of our courage to start doing this. But then in the time you understand how this is helpful to other people that you're reaching in. Because those people are content creators and they're looking for topics to talk about, to share. And your products, my products, my passion with our ceramics are worth sharing and worth noticing. They are probably more valuable to, I don't know, no more commercial in the shop, in, in the newspaper. Why not? And, uh, and this is how you do it. This way, if you are putting your products in their books, in the magazines, in other people or social media, you, you, wrote, you grow your credibility and social proof about how you are doing. Yeah, so this is the eight different parts that you can participate. Um, each of them is very interesting and giving you a different kind of activity, different kind of challenge to reach and understand. I would personally recommend, especially if you are beginning, to try all of them to gain your own experience about it and understand what you like, what you don't like, what uh, is working for you. But at the same time, um, you can decide later what works better for you. So I know people uh, who do only fair to market uh, and working with the tail shops. Um, I know a person who sells mainly through social media by more kind of private check-in, uh, private message. Uh, uh, option. So it really gives you a lot of flexibility, but in the modern time you really have to do it. And that's how it works. Um, the challenges of running your own business, me as a, I'm now in the starting the third year of my business, I wouldn't maybe say it's challenges, but uh, my advice is what to focus on is time management. It's extremely important not to lose time on the projects that are not working, on collaboration that are not going to bring you anything. Um, start thinking two steps forward, maybe in the fashion um, market, especially this is very visible, that is six months uh, advance for the collection. So incorporate maybe this one. So don't create in the moment to think forward. And have the business approach. Don't drop the prices. Uh, this is how you are not getting discouraged from making a living from a passion. And yes, it's your passion, but it has to be your business. And uh, sometimes you have to really put your feet down and make the hard decision and don't agree on things that really are not in your competence, not your interest, not lose time on that. And at the end, it's important to have support and inspiration. Have a person, at least one person, that you can talk about your difficulties, about the struggles you do, because it's a huge struggle, really, to set up your business um, like that without anybody really helping you. And find mentors, uh, people who are maybe a couple of steps uh, ahead of you, people who are specialists in the field, specialists in the social marketing, in the handmade business, finding the right audience. It's really important to stay motivated because um, setting your own business yourself, the entrepreneurship, is like, um, it's one of the most difficult things you can do. It's one of the most courageous things you can do. And many people don't understand it. We have, I think, every week somebody can to the studio and be amazed or shocked that we are working the way we are working. And they don't understand that you can set your own business and work with the ceramics with that. So it can be really a mind changing to other people. It can be a mind changing to you, to your um, people around you. 
and have you a freedom and um, kind of boost of confidence of value about what you do. And this is how I say thank you for your attention. And here is uh, my credits for um, also visiting my website and uh, and my social media because I feel uh, it's really important to share about that and talk about it. Um, thank you very much. I hope I didn't talk too long. And everything no, well. not at all. <laughs> not at all. Thank you, Carolina, for uh, sharing uh, your experience uh, as a young maker. People appreciated your comments and your suggestion on the chat. Uh, I read some comments. And um, it's interesting, this idea of a small production in a co-working space. Uh, co-working is a magic word that is very popular in this, uh, in this period. Sharing uh, knowledge, uh, skills, uh, and um, production is uh, something that it is uh, very uh, actual. Mm -hmm. And it, it goes to the idea also of sustainability of the space we work in. In France, uh, we experienced uh, last uh, February, March, uh, a project of co-working. Uh, and we hope to be able uh, to offer this opportunity uh, to young makers very soon. And uh, this uh, will be a very important space and uh, challenge also for uh, a, a city of uh, ceramic tradition like, uh, like Faenza. So um, we come to the end of uh, this uh, long uh, day after more than uh, three hours uh, of uh, talks. And uh, I'd like uh, to, to have on the panel all the speakers, if it is uh, possible, and uh, thanking them to stay with us uh, till, uh, till uh, the end. And uh, uh, today uh, we were supposed to, to talk about the future of uh, ceramic. What is the future of ceramic? Uh, and uh, what? But we talk more about attitudes, uh, pro projects, uh, and of course design. We talk about consciousness, responsibility, and eng engagement for the future of uh, ceramic, and not only of ceramic. Uh, we talk about uh, and uh, we support it, uh, an holistic approach uh, uh, to design and uh, uh, to activity in general. The commitment with the ceramic and especially with design. And uh, I think what, it, what emerged in a very uh, important uh, way is uh, the necessity of sustainability today in every production. Uh, which, uh, as you know, which is one of the goals of the EU Agenda 2030. So, um, we have different voices, we have different uh, experiences, uh, we, and I really thank all the, the speakers for sharing with us um, their presentation and uh, to give us some uh, idea, uh, ideas of new approach of uh, what could be today um, uh, using hands, uh, the skills of hands, supporting the skills of hands, uh, using also technology, of course, but uh, using especially uh, the mind, uh, not only the hands, for uh, the, a sustainable project uh, uh, for our planet. I, I'd like to give the word to Victoria for uh, closing uh, this uh, meeting as a uh, representative of uh, CERDE and the EU uh, project. Uh, thank you, uh, Claudia, for giving me a floor. It was definitely a pleasure uh, to uh, be here today uh, for this uh, conference. I heard uh, many uh, interesting uh, presentation and thank you also for uh, all uh, the speakers for sharing your uh, story, your experiences, your idea. Uh, I believe our uh, listeners and our participants can uh, take uh, many messages from this uh, conference today and maybe uh, just to point out a couple of uh, main aspects that were uh, mentioned 
uh, today this is uh, first of all uh, if we start uh, it's uh, uh, this digitalization and uh, moving to a digital world and it was very interesting uh, to hear uh, your suggestions and your experiences uh, with this uh, digital uh, world and as uh, Chuck said in his uh, presentation uh, if we talk about uh, art and culture and design, of course, it's very difficult that the digital world uh, will uh, replace virtual, but it will it definitely uh, can and should be uh, support and it should uh, complement uh, your uh, work. Uh, also, uh, we are uh, here present today from uh, different countries and this is uh, another point I would like uh, to underline, this international cooperation, sharing of uh, different, um, different experiences, but different uh, traditions and uh, different approaches. And also uh, Massimo is not here, but he uh, put it uh, very nicely that uh, uh, art should be uh, open to the world and uh, not uh, just stay closed, even though it's very much linked to its uh, roots. And what uh, I particularly uh, liked uh, is uh, the awareness of all the speakers on the sustainable development. And this has been um, uh, emphasized uh, through many different examples from recycling materials from uh, to um, create bricks uh, but also uh, we heard uh, the problems of uh, electronic waste and how this is uh, linked to design uh, this is very very important aspect and even though uh, maybe it's not uh, the top priority uh, when we talk about art and culture, I'm very glad uh, to see that all of you are uh, so much uh, aware um, that we uh, should um, uh, develop, let's say, our life uh, more linked uh, to the nature and uh, observe uh, the needs uh, of uh, the nature. Uh, so maybe also to conclude uh, with uh, what Giovanna mentioned, uh, this uh, new European uh, Bauhaus initiative and how this links uh, to everything. Uh, what I have mentioned uh, when talking about uh, culture, art and design, uh, we should move in uh, sustainable, inclusive, but also a beautiful uh, way. And uh, of course, always having uh, in mind this uh, aspect uh, of uh, beauty uh, in, in our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Beauty will save the world, as you, we know, we all know. And um, I, I remind everybody that uh, this uh, uh, conference will stay on our uh, YouTube channel, Mick Fans. So uh, if you want to share it with uh, other, um, other person, please, uh, it's our pleasure uh, to give this tool of experiences uh, to different audiences. So thank you very much for staying with us about around four hours. <laughs> thank you very much and see you on our channel.